Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. So how you doing guys? Hope you all are doing great so in this video we are gonna see what if Naruto was great swordsman. This is part 2 and if you want more then please leave a like share and subscribe. Let's get in the video. The first two and a half years of Academy flew past for the now 11 year old Naruto and his friends, which now brought in to include the weirdly shy Hinata Hayuga, the puzzling Shino Aburam, and the perennially sulking Sasuke Cha. Naruto was able to keep pace with Kiba easily and on occasion beat him in a foot race, but on the few occasions he ran against Sasuke, he was never once able to beat the raven-haired boy. Naruto still continued his training in secret but joined his friends in the park as often as he could. However, with his friends being whisked away by their parents for private training of their own and Naruto's first steps into learning kenjutsu forms, the amount of time he spent with them had drastically reduced. It had been a while since everyone had been able to meet together and Choji and Ino had managed to convince the entire group that they should all meet up to celebrate the large boy's birthday at the Barbec restaurant. Naruto was to pick up Ino after her shift at the flower shop and then head over to the restaurant together. As he left his room, he spied the Bakken lying by his door, which triggered a memory of his first encounter with his Kenjutsu master. The academic year was split midway to allow the students to recuperate a little recharge their batteries so to speak. The teachers however, planned the break, as it was close to impossible to maintain the focus of a bunch of restless pre-teens during the very warm summer months. During the break of his second year at the academy, Naruto was able to spend more time training than he was during the academic year. It was during one of his strength training sessions that he had first met her. She had merely introduced her as Cat, a codename that fit well with the designs on her mask. Naruto knew almost instantaneously that he was in the presence of the person that formulated his training regimen, with the approval of the Hokage. She was soft-spoken and introduced herself as the person who would instruct Naruto in the art of swordsmanship if he chose to accept her tutelage. Naruto was ecstatic, but as it was late at night, he decided to curb his enthusiasm and reply with a simple hi. Naruto-kun, as of now, I am unable to reveal my identity to you, but know that I care for your safety. I have been watching your progress in your training and have been most impressed. Maybe one day, we can also discuss some of the material you have covered in the books I prescribed for you, Kat told Naruto, turning off her voice modifying switch in her mask, lest she intimidate the boy unnecessarily. Hinoha doesn't have very many sword users, the flash and appeal of ninjutsu sway a lot of young ninja away from the way of the sword. I would like to mold you into a fine shinobi whose skill with the sword is unparalleled in this nation. What do you have to say, Naruto? Naruto was well aware that his instructor to be was a member of the elite Anbu division of Konoha Shinobi, evidenced by the choice of armor and mask. Assuming she would prefer a more serious approach to the matter, he replied as professionally as an out-of-breath 12-year-old boy covered in sweat and grime could. It would be my honor, Kat Senpai. Hat laughed at the young boy's antics. She had watched Naruto interact with the Hokage and those of his age, and she was acutely aware that this was uncharacteristic behavior for the boy. You don't need to be so formal with me, Naruto. But know that I am quite a strict taskmaster. Smiling at having established an easy relationship with his masked instructor, Naruto fell back into a relaxed stance. He wasn't sure about how well he would be with the sword, but he was extremely comfortable with his Bakken and was eager to learn more about using swords. Unfortunately, my duty to the Hokage and the village comes first, and I will often be on missions. When I have the time, I shall send you a message, and we shall meet at a suitable training ground. As you can imagine, we can only train at night to ensure my involvement in your development is unnoticed. Wait for my next message and until then keep training your body and mind, Yugao explained to the boy as she disappeared in a leaf shunshin. Naruto's covert training sessions with Cad always left him exhausted. He would find little notes slid under his doorway after he returned from classes at the academy, instructing him of the when and the where of his clandestine meetings. It had been just under a year since Naruto was introduced to the various forms and stances of Kenjutsu. The rigid rules of Kenjutsu made it counterintuitive and difficult for Naruto to adopt, but he managed to make steady progress. In the few friendlies that took place between master and student, Naruto had never been able to land a blow on any part of Cat. However, that was to be expected she was Anbu and he was still in the academy. Whilst reminiscing about the past on the way to pick up Ino, Naruto bumped into a large burly man who had just stepped out of one of the taverns. Watch it punk. Said the man, the stench of alcohol reaching Naruto and making him crinkle his nose in reaction. Oh. I am sorry. I wasn't paying attention, Naruto replied with a bow. Recognizing the mop of spiky blonde hair, the man took a large swing at the lowered head and clobbered the boy, sending him face first to meet the paved street. Naruto clutched his head in defense but left his side open to attack and the man took full advantage and proceeded to kick the boy to his heart's content. 
The relentless attack finally culminated when an off-duty ninja spotted the attack as he turned into the street that would lead him to the same tavern as the one from which Naruto's attacker had previously exited. The ninja attacked the large man and warned him to leave immediately under threat of action. As Naruto sat up on the floor to face his savior, the ninja told the boy to wait outside the bar for a minute. Feeling no malice from his protector, Naruto complied and a minute later, the ninja returned with a glass of water in his hand. Are you alright? Asked the ninja to the still-seated boy. Oh. Stupid question. Do you think you have any broken bones? As Naruto got off the street to stand up, a sharp wave of pain emanated from his right side, suggesting that the man had kicked him hard enough to break a rib or two. I'll be fine soon enough, said Naruto to the yet-to-be-identified ninja. It was true, Naruto healed from a myriad of injuries during his short life with a miraculous rate of recovery. Consuming the proffered water, Naruto returned the glass to the ninja. Thank you ninja-san. I must be on my way, I have to meet some friends. Naruto walked away from the tavern and proceeded towards the Amanaka flower shop, favoring his right side, even as he felt the pain reduce with each passing step. A glass of water is the least I could do for you, Naruto-kun thought the masked ninja with his high tape covering his left eye. Mood fouled, he forwent his tavern visit and decided to call it an early night. Naruto reached the flower shop just as Ino finished preparing the last bouquet for a familiar-looking couple. As Naruto entered the shop, the ringing of the bell attracted the attention of the Ino towards the ragged-looking blonde. Naruto. I am just finishing up here. What happened? You are covered in dust. Well, just clear up your face at the basin in the corner. Just give me a bit to change out of these clothes, and I will be right with you, Ino said without pause hurrying towards her house, missing her friend's true state of affairs in her haste to prepare for the party. As Naruto washed his face and returned to the counter, he noticed that the couple from earlier were Shikamaru's parents and that they were still at the shop. Hello Narasan, said Naruto meekly, turning his face away when he noticed the questioning glance that was thrown his way courtesy of both parents. Unable to bear the scrutiny anymore, Naruto came up with a weak lie. You see, I was on my way here, and I was daydreaming and walked into a lamp post. Ha ha, clumsy me. Chikaku was displeased and replied in kind. Naruto, I am a ninja, and my whole career is based on deception. Please don't insult my intelligence. If you ran into a post why are you favoring your right side? No one walks into a post sideways. Hearing Ino shout out a goodbye to her mother and the concern in Miwa's eyes, Naruto decided to tell the Naras the truth. All right. I was on my way here and I wasn't paying attention and ran into a drunk. He punched and kicked me. Please don't tell anyone this, especially Ino. She always fusses over everyone. If she finds out, the whole mood of the party will turn sour and we haven't met in so long, and I don't want to be the reason this party doesn't go well. Please, Naruto replied so quickly that the Naras had a difficult time catching all the words he said. The Naras were dumbfounded and had nothing to say, but their expressive eyes told Naruto that their concern was legitimate. At that very moment, Ino ran past the Naras, pulled on Naruto's arm and dragged him along with her. Come on Naruto, it's time to go. We are late already. Mua turned to Shikaku and said, honey, we have to do something for him. What happened to him shouldn't be happening to anyone, especially someone of his age. What if it was Shikakun? I know what we need to do, but first we need to talk to Shika about it too. This will change his life as well. I am sure he won't have problem, and then I will petition the council after I consult with the Hokage, Shikaku told his wife, eliciting a small smile from her. It was all her could do for her for now. The party was a roaring success with Sasuke, Shino and Hinata all coming over to the restaurant to celebrate Joji's birthday. As the group broke up eventually and everyone headed their separate ways, Shikamaru was the only person who noticed that Naruto was far more subdued today than he would have been normally. Initially, Shikamaru chalked it down to a matter of fatigue as a result of Naruto's own training. Naruto's rate of improvement was quite sensational, and he knew that the extra speed and lithe physique did not come from just training sessions with Kiba. It was only when Naruto left the room to head to the restroom that Shikamaru realized that his mannerisms was a consequence of an injury and not fatigue. Still, he could have picked up the injury while training. If he is training without supervision, it is quite likely to happen after all, Shikamaru thought to himself. When Shikamaru returned home late that night, he was surprised to see his parents not only awake but waiting for him. Surely I couldn't be in trouble. Curious, Shikamaru sat down on one of the empty couches and let his parents take the lead in their own time. Aheyo, Shikakun. How was the birthday celebration? Miwa asked her son. It was all right. Mom, Dad, I know this isn't why you are still up. Is everything all right? Shikamaru asked his parents. Chikaku smiled a melancholic smile, his son was sharp as ever he would be a great ninja and a valuable asset to Konoha in the future. Fair enough. It's too late in the night to be beating around the bush. 
son, we are concerned about Naruto-kun's safety and well-being and as such wished to adopt him into the family to protect him better, Shikaku told his son. To his credit, Shikamaru didn't fall of his seat. For that matter, he barely showed any change in expression. Well, if he is too lazy to become a good ninja, at the very least he can become a great poker player, Shikaku thought to himself, momentarily distracting himself from the serious situation at hand. You want to know if I would be comfortable with having an adopted brother? Shikamaru asked his parents rhetorically. I can see why you are concerned for his safety. I saw him nursing quite an injury just today, I take it you know more about it than I do. Questioned the Nara heir. The silence in the air and the concerned look in his mother's eyes provided an answer in and of itself. I like him. He is a good kid and quite clever in his own ways. Besides, no one our age should be living alone. I'm proud of you guys for taking the initiative, Shikamaru finished. The elation from his parents was more than worth the oncoming hassles of sharing a house with a loud blonde. Well, there is a lot of red tape and loopholes to jump through to successfully adopt him. Even if he doesn't know it yet, Naruto is quite special, but we aren't going to give up without one hell of a fight, Shikaku told his son as his wife went to embrace him. Well, if all goes well, the Nara compound is going to get a lot noisier. There goes the neighborhood, Shikamaru said with a sarcastic roll of his eyes. The light laughter that ensued lifted the spirits and the mood of the Naras, and they headed towards their respective bedrooms. As Shikamaru reached the stairs, he turned around and asked, Naruto didn't mention anything today. I take it you haven't told him yet? No, not yet. We can tell him tomorrow. After all, he might not even want to be adopted after living alone for so long, Shikaku replied to his son's question. Stuffing his hands into his pockets, Shikamaru climbed the stairs towards his bedroom, merely nodding once to acknowledge that he had heard his father's response. The following day, Shikaku and Miwa approached the Hokage with their plan to adopt Naruto into their family. Miwa-chan, I appreciate your concern, but the council will never let the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi be adopted into any clan of Konoha. It would upset the balance of power between the existing clans. You would never get a majority ruling in your favor, even with the backing of the Akimichi and Yamanaka clans, Hiruzen did not want to crush the possibility of offering Naruto a stable life, but as Hokage he had to appear just and fair. What if we offer him a place to stay? Shikaku said, confusing the Hokage about what he meant. I mean to say, what if we adopt Naruto into the family but not into the clan? He would remain in Yuzumaki, but he would live with us. That might work, we could use the argument of mental stability and loyalty to convince that scheming warhawk that if and when Naruto would learn of the Kyubi, it would be favorable for us to have him in a stable environment. I don't like it though. I feel like I am lying to myself, Hiruzen thought out loudly. Very well, let us see what Naruto thinks of the idea, and if he is open to the adoption, then we can go ahead, Hiruzen finished, letting out a loud sigh to emphasize his uneasiness with the political maneuvering that would follow in the weeks, if not months, to come considering Naruto's status as a Jinchuriki. The only other time adoption for Naruto had come into question was in the immediate aftermath of his birth, and Hiruzen had denied permission as he was skeptical of the motives of the Ichiha clan, the ones that offered to take Naruto in. A few days later, Naruto was summoned to the Hokage's office, and for the first time in his summons, a time was specified. Naruto thought it strange, but made sure to plan his training so that he would be free when requested. When Naruto arrived at the specified time, he was pleasantly surprised to find Shikamaru there as well. He had not met his friend since Choji's birthday party and was about to talk to him when he noticed the other two adults in the room Miwa and Shikaku Nara. Bound politely to them in greeting, Naruto turned to the Hokage in askance, what's going on old man? Instead of a reply from the Hokage, Naruto heard a startled gasp from Miwa and an amused chuckle from Shikaku. Waving it off, Hiruzen got right to the reason behind this meeting. Naruto-kun, the Naras and I want to take some more measures towards your safety and well-being, and they have requested to adopt you. As the four heads in the room turned towards Naruto expectantly, all they were met with was silence. Naruto's face was quite unreadable. The lack of emotion almost made it seem that the boy's face had been frozen and was unable to muster any form of expression. Naruto's turned his face towards the floor, and the only indication that he was alive was the slight quivering of his shoulders. Since this was quite the big deal, no one decided to push him into giving an answer. I. When I was in the orphanage I heard that kids over the age of six don't usually get picked for adoption. I gave up I mean I am close to double that age now I didn't think I'd ever have parents my best shot for a family was going to be when I made one of my own, said Naruto, slight sobs racking his frame indicated by the increased quiver of his shoulders. I don't get it. Why now? Why not earlier? I mean, I have been alone for 11 years. You saw me that day at the flower shop and decided on a whim. I don't want pity. I have gone on just fine ignoring the hate in everyone's eyes, finished Naruto, turning to the elder Naras, awaiting a reply. 
Lewis spoke up, Naruto-kun, you might not believe it, but there are a lot of people who genuinely care for you. More so than you know. Forget the idiots in the village. We want to give you a family and a home. We want to keep you safe. You are quite special to us. Silence ensued again, and this time it lasted significantly longer than the first. Still, no one prodded the boy. As the sobs subdued, Naruto lifted his head slowly, exposing the wet carpet spots indicating the tears that escaped his eyes. Naruto turned to Shikamaru and asked, so Shikamaru, when do I get to call you Shikani? With a characteristic TSK and a mutter of troublesome, Shikamaru placed his hand on Naruto's right shoulder and gave him a smile. Mua was ecstatic and hugged the boy from behind, embracing both Naruto and Shikamaru in the process, resulting in the latter boy squirming in her embrace, attempting to wriggle out. Shikamaru's futile attempts resulted in laughter from the majority of the group and helped to reduce the anxiety in the room. Hiruzen cleared his throat in order to direct attention towards himself, and Naruto looked towards his Hokage. Naruto-kun, you should know that there is a process involved in the adoption, and it must be cleared with the Shinobi Council first. This means it could take time, and the decision could swing either way. Therefore, until it is confirmed, I urge you and Shikamaru not to say anything to your friends or anyone for that matter. Naruto looked dubious and voiced his concerns accordingly. The council. None of the kids at the orphanage needed clearance from them. Why is it the case for my adoption? As you will be a ninja of Kanoha soon, there are some matters that need to be discussed, here is in light easily. It saddened him to deceive the boy, but the Hokage did not feel that he was ready to know all the secrets about his past. Naruto accepted what the Hokage had had to say as the truth and turned to face Shikaku, who had just moved to place his hand on the boy. There is one thing you need to know Naruto-kun. To honor the memory of your biological parents, we would like you to keep your last name and not change it to Nara, finished the clan head of the Shadow Users. You will have a house and a family in the future, but it is important not to forget your roots. Shikamaru raised an intrigued eyebrow at this revelation, as he was not aware of this part of the plan. While the Nara name carried some weight around Kanoha, surely an adoption into the clan as opposed to the house, as it were, would not be a big deal. However, he did not voice his opinion as his father's explanation regarding honoring Naruto's parents' memory made sense to him. I might not know them, but I am sure I would not want to forget them. I'll continue to be in Yuzumaki, Naruto told Shikaku. Hiruzen dismissed the two boys on the account of wanting to discuss the legal issues concerning the adoption. When the boys had left, the Hokage discussed their plans to convince the council to favor the adoption. As this was a newly conceived idea, there was not much to talk about and at its conclusion, Hiruzen decided to tell the Naras about Naruto's extra training. One of my ninja has been training Naruto in the art of Kenjutsu. Assuming the adoption goes favorably, I would very much appreciate it if you would let the boy continue his studies. His instructor tells me he holds much promise, Hiruzen told the parents at across the table from him. Of course Hokage-sama, Shikaku said whilst getting up. Mua followed suit, and the couple took their leave. Ever since the Kayubi disaster, the only truly troublesome matter that the Hokage had had to deal with was the attempted at Ichihaku and the subsequent massacre that followed. Naruto's adoption had the potential to place itself right up there in his list of headaches. Hiruzen was determined to fight for Naruto's well-being, but he was well aware that he was up against a massive hurdle. However, he would have support this time the Naras, the Yamanakas, the Akimichis and possibly even the Inuzukas and Aburams would be favorable to the adoption. Things already looked promising in gaining a majority vote, but Danzo, Kahara and Hamura posed a significant threat to his plans, and he could ill afford to ignore their persuasive abilities. The tension in the council room was so thick on the day the Naras announced their plans to adopt Naruto Uzumaki that Joza Akimichi could have sworn Danzo Shimura shot off an electric attack from his solitary eye, only to be countered by a similar attack from his own shadow-using friend. No progress was made on the subject matter, and no opinions were swayed. The Naras vehemently decided to stick to their argument of protection for the boy, while their opposition insisted that the balance of power between the clans would be thrown off. Even with assurances that Naruto would not be a Nara and would continue being an Uzumaki, answerable only to his Hokage, the council was not fully convinced. However, the few people who were previously sitting on the fence and held sympathy for the boy's plight were now leaning in favor of the adoption. But the lack of success and the certainty that the subject matter would be broached again in the next council meeting in two weeks' time, the meeting broke up before the hostility in the room escalated and translated to a course of action, which would only bring about regret. Determined to bring the adoption to fruition, Shikaku and Hiruzen met often to formulate ways to convince the council to bring forth a favorable ruling. They worked tirelessly and often employed Joza's and Inachi's advice to help solve the issue at hand. This information was the deadliest tool in the ninja trade. A ninja misinformed about the strength and capabilities of his or her opponent was facing an uphill task before the mission even commenced. 
for sensitive black op missions such as the one Yugao was about to undertake, the ability to adapt once the lack of information was identified was often the difference between life and death. Lying in her hospital bed, Yuga recalled the conversation she had with the Hokage, but a week ago and the subsequent mission she was sent out on. Most Anbu Black Op missions were issued by the Hokage in person, as sensitive information such as the mission parameters and targets could not be afforded a paper trail. As Yuga entered the Hokage office, she unfastened her cat-designed mask and stood at attention. Pat, a certain businessman in the land of the wave, is causing a lot of trouble for their inhabitants. We believe that ridding this man from his position of power will allow Kanoha a favorable standing with the people of the country. While their economic situation is deplorable, their geographical position puts them in quite an advantage. They are a common port for many trading ships. If you chose to accept, you will be required to kill Gato, the head of Gato Company, here is an informed Yugao. It shall be done, Hokage-sama, replied Yugao. One more thing, the Naras wish to adopt Naruto into their family. He won't be a Nara, but he will have a family and a home. What do you think? Here is in question you got curious to know what the Kanoichi thought about the matter. A stable house could do the boy wonders. Hopefully, some of that Narakam will rub off on him. When he gets frustrated in our sessions, he forgets his training and starts attacking with reckless abandon. I can't see any harm done with the proposal. However, I can't imagine all of the Shinobi Council approves, said Yugao. We shall see what happens. Know that while there is no formal timescale for your mission, the sooner you accomplish your objective the better, finished the Hokage. Here is in handed Yugao a small scroll. She opened the scroll, memorized the contents and proceeded to burn the scroll. Yugao placed a mask on her face again, bowed low and disappeared in a shunshin. As Yugao was leaving through the gates of Kanoha, she took a detour to head towards Naruto's house and slid a note under his door, informing him that there would be no practice sessions for a while. The contents of the scroll had informed her that Gato had employed a few samurai bodyguards for protection. Yugao knew she could dispatch those men easily and then proceed with the assassination of the shipping magnate. In the cover of the night, Yugao proceeded to tree hop until she reached the border between the fire country and wave country. Hiding her armor and other ninja tools in her pack, Yugao donned civilian clothing and rented a hotel room in the land of waves. She would finish off the mission under the cover of the following night. The two-day journey to the border and the subsequent journey on foot to the land of waves meant Yugao reached her hotel late at night, three nights after her departure from Kanoha. Using the daylight hours to recuperate her lost energy and strength, Yugao idly wondered what Naruto had been doing over the days of her absence. She admired the boy's work ethic, the results of which were clearly defined in his lithe physique and improved speed. However, he had much room for improvement in his sword techniques. Yugao waited until past midnight before she began her preliminary scouting of the premises. Her search revealed that there were three, hired Ronin, as was outlined in the scroll she had burnt earlier. Satisfied with her search, Yugao slunk into the shadows and proceeded to make her way through to the room, which housed the sleeping Gato. Making short work of the three Ronin, Yugao made her way towards the room with an uneasy feeling. She couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, and her paranoia served her well as she ducked at the opportune moment to avoid a thrown kunai from her blind spot. Quickly turning to face her attacker, Yugao cursed at the side in front of her. A ninja was part of the protection detail as well a former cloud shinobi, if his scratched out hightate was anything to go by. Cold steely eyes bored into Yugao's own brown orbs as both ninja prepared for battle. The tiny corridor they were situated in was inappropriate for the upcoming battle. The inevitable demolition that would follow could cause a cave-in and result in Yugao causing harm to herself, even at the prospect of dealing a blow to her target. Thinking quickly, Yugao threw a pair of kunai at her attacker who pulled out his sword to deflect the thrown projectiles with ease. Seeing her opponent's sword drawn, Yugao was tempted to draw her own, and the two commenced their deadly battle. As sword struck in mid-air, Yugao was acutely aware that her attacker was maneuvering her away from her target however, she paid this no heed, as she fully intended to return to the room once she dispatched of her current opponent. Entering the vast backyard of the compound, the battle picked up pace and vigor, as the two swordsmen were afforded the luxury of space. Yugao was mildly impressed with the cloud ninja's ability with the sword. He had managed to keep pace with the Kanoichi with ease. Deciding to test her opponent further, Yugao decided to step things up a notch and gauge the former Cloud Ninja's abilities further. The clashing of swords had alerted Gato of an intruder, and he was proved correct when he heard the sound echo from his backyard. Gato quickly retreated to his panic room and commanded his bodyguards to aid in killing the intruder. When Gato got no response from them, he realized they were no longer among the living and hoped the expensive ninja that he hired would be sufficient for the job. The deadly dance between the Cloud Ninja and Yugao continued, the only sound between the two coming from the moments in which their swords clanged against each other. Coming to a stalemate once again, the two ninja pushed off each other to gain some distance. 
For the first time in their encounter, the Cloud Ninja spoke up. You are very adept with the sword Kinoichi-san. Smirking behind her mask, Yuga replied, Unfortunately, I can't seem to find much fault in your skill either Nukunin-san. As the short reprieve finished, the two ninja continued their battle of swords ducking and slashing at each other to no avail. Yugao finally created an opportunity for herself when she ducked underneath a horizontal slash and cut her attacker's ligaments in his right leg, causing a severe blow to the man's speed. As she rose up behind her attacker, she was caught off guard when she heard a yell of cloud style. Reverse beheading as Yugao turned an instinct, she noticed her attacker was in the process of finishing a spin, attempting to cut her head off in the process. Acting instinctively, Yugao put up her left arm in defense. However, the act was futile as the sword strike cut through the lightweight arm guard she had on, and the sword slashed through the length of her arm, severing muscle and tendon asunder. The two swordsmen were at an impasse. Yugao was bleeding profusely from her arm and needed to make a strategic retreat, lest she bleed to her death. She also knew that the damage caused to her opponent meant that he could not give chase. Consigned to the fact that her mission was a failure, she made a hasty retreat until the border of Kanoha, making a quick detour, only to stop off at her hotel room to pick up her pack, which contained the required first aid kit. Bandaging up the large wound, Yugao swallowed some blood replenishing pills and some soldier pills, and made her way to Kanoha as quickly as possible, ignoring the biting pain from her left arm. The journey back took Yugao half the time it took her to get to the land of waves, stopping twice once to change her bandage and once to get some rest and add a fresh wrapping of her bandage. Reaching the gates of Kanoha, Yugao was quickly ushered to the hospital for emergency treatment. Despite her best efforts, the wound she had sustained had still managed to become infected, and the severity of the damage to her arm meant that she needed specialist help to aid in her recovery. The mission had taken four and a half days, and she had spent the last three days in the hospital. As she recovered from her infection fairly quickly, the lack of sensation in her left arm was bothersome. Her sessions with the specialist yielded no results, and she was doomed to countless sessions of physiotherapy until the muscles knitted themselves back together so that her arm would once again be functional. After spending a week in the hospital, she was beginning to become frustrated. The Hokage had come to meet her so that she could get debriefed about the mission, and while she knew he was disappointed at the outcome of the mission, he did not express his displeasure. On the eighth day, the Hokage, in the company of the Anbu Commander Bear and the specialist doctor that had been tending to her over the past week, visited Yugao once again. The Heyo Yugao-chan. I come bearing good news and bad news. The good news is that you can be discharged today. However, you still have to schedule sessions with the doctor to aid your recovery. The bad news, and I tell you this after much discussion with Bear, is that we are going to suspend you from Anbu duties until you make a full recovery, the Hokage told Yugao, trying to break the news as gently as possible. Yugao had come to expect this not the date of her discharge, but the fact that she would no longer be Anbu. Anbu ninja were the elite of the elite requiring ninja to go on missions, which would be considered suicidal by others. As such, the ninja of the Anbu had to be the most skilled, as well as fully fit for duties. With her current lack of sensation in her left arm, Yugao left herself exposed to equally dangerous enemies, which could threaten the completion of the mission, as well as her safety during a mission and the well-being of any comrade she would have. Yugao tried to look brave in front of her Hokage and Anbu commander, but with words escaping her, she managed a meek nod and turned her eyes away from the pair with a downcast look. The pair took their leave allowing the doctor to do one last checkup before Yugao left the hospital. Satisfied that there were no further complications to his patient's condition, he took his leave as well, leaving the Kinoichi to her thoughts. Yugao was recruited into Anbu just as she had become a jonin. Recognizing the opportunity presented to her, Yugao forwent her aspirations of being an instructor to serve in the prestigious ranks of Anbu. Yugao was certain that she would be reinstated to her jonin status after her discharge. The life of exciting missions already behind her and she had to forfeit her dreams of being a jonin instructor for the upcoming batch of ninja, as she had not put forth her name in the list of prospective instructors. Damn it, if I had known then at least I could have been an instructor. Maybe, I could have taught Naruto-kun officially. Thinking about her charge, she idly wondered if she could still teach the boy outside of his own training with his genin squad. As she thought about it, a smile came across her features for the first time since she found out about her dismissal from the Anbu Corps. It wouldn't be a problem he was still not going to be able to land a strike on her. Before Yugao would have to surrender her Anbu mask, she was determined to meet Naruto one last time with it. She would need to tell the boy about her predicament and how it would affect him. Meeting in the clearings of one of the training grounds, Naruto was anticipating a new lesson with his sensei. He had not had a lesson in well over a week, and he did not want his limited skills to get rusty. Shadow practice could only go so far, a real opponent was needed to keep his skills sharp. 
Hey oh, cat senpai, Naruto said when he spotted his master leaning on one of the trees that shaped the clearing. Hey oh, Naruto-kun. I need to tell you something. I was assigned an Anbu mission and sustained an injury whilst in combat. As such, I have been suspended from the Anbu until I recover. Naruto was confused as to why his master was telling him this would this mean that their sessions were going to stop. But he thoroughly enjoyed sword training. Was the injury so serious that his master could not be a ninja at all? As the doubts plagued Naruto's mind, Yugao decided to clarify the matter. I will still be teaching you. But now, I have no need for this mask. The soft click indicating that Yugao was unfastening her mask focused Naruto's eyes, as he was now aware that he was about to see his master's face for the first time. As the mask was removed, Naruto laid eyes on his sensei's face for the first time the purple hair he had already seen, coupled with the brown eyes, pale complexion and lips accentuated by a deep red lipstick, made Naruto think of only one thing she is cuter than Sakura-chan and Ino-chan. Wondering where that comparison came from, Naruto quickly refocused himself and shot of a series of questions. You said you were hurt senpai. Is the injury serious? Would you be taking a break from teaching? Laughing lightly, Yugao assured her protege that her plans for him would not be affected by her injury. Upon further show of concern for her well-being from Naruto, Yugao became exasperated and disappeared from Naruto's view, only to reappear with her blade drawn out, pointing towards the boy's back from her position behind him. Just because I am hurt doesn't make me useless Naruto-kun, you would do well to remember that. But those last words, Naruto's latest session with his recently unmasked instructor began. The session was especially brutal, and he was sure this was the case, because Yuga wanted to prove the point she made in her last comment. When the session finally ended, Naruto thanked his sensei, thank you, cat sensei, Naruto finished with a bow. Not anymore. Without this mask, I am not cat anymore. You can call me Yuga sensei, replied the former Anbu ninja. Hi, Yuga sensei Naruto said, bowing down once again before he left the clearing, heading home for some well-deserved rest and relaxation. As the end of June rolled in, Hiruzen and Shikaku had been battling the non-committal fraction of the Shinobi Council tooth and nail to sway the required number of votes their way. But the knowledge that the Ino Shikacho group would stick together through thick and thin in Hiruzen support, Shikaku could not see them losing this vote, but it would be unwise to count his chickens before they hatched. Despite Danzo's explicit distan for the adoption of Naruto Uzumaki by Shikaku and Miwanara, the motion passed favorably. Naruto was called into the Hokage Tower, along with Shikamaru and Miwa. Naruto was unaware of the results of the adoption vote and assumed that he was to meet the Hokage about his monthly allowance for the month of July. When Naruto walked in, he saw the three Naras he was familiar with and greeted them politely, offering Shikamaru an overtly enthusiastic hug. Naruto, I am happy to announce that the council has voted in favor of your adoption. You can move in with the Naras at your earliest convenience, Hiruzen told Naruto. The words Naruto caught caused him to become glazed over and he turned to the elder Naras for confirmation of the news. Getting an affirmative nod from Shikaku, Naruto ran towards the couple to hug them briefly, before he jumped onto his brother and hugged and shook him in delight. At the end of his celebrations, the tears in Naruto's eyes were evident, but he did not mind them, as they were tears of celebration and happiness. So Naruto-kun, when do you want to go tell all your friends about this? Shikaku asked with a knowing smile as both his sons had been forbidden to speak about the adoption until it was finalized, and expecting Naruto to keep such a big secret from his friends was clearly unnatural for the blonde. Right now. Come on Shik and I, said Naruto with a face-splitting smile, as he headed off towards the park to share the news. It was the weekend and training could wait a couple of hours. Watching Naruto drag an unwilling Shikamaru along, the Hokage and the Nara couple laughed along before they sat down to finalize the details of the adoption. Iruka Yamino was puzzled and thoroughly so. His most controversial student, Naruto Uzumaki, had managed to spectacularly fail the last portion of his exam. There was no indication that this sort of thing would happen. Regretfully, he could not change the rules a student needs passing grades in the written exams, basic skills and ninjutsu to graduate from the ninja academy. In fact, Naruto had started brilliantly well. Ever since his adoption by the Nara clan, Naruto had become far more focused in his studies. Hiruka assumed the added devotion was some sort of means to repay the Naras for their kindness. Whatever it was, Hiruka was happy as a serious Naruto meant a non-pranking Naruto most of the time. Naruto's skill with tojutsu and weapon handling were showing promising developments over the past two years, and Naruka felt he had himself to blame if he couldn't have spotted Naruto's need for remedial instruction in bunshin making. The clone Naruto made during his examination period was so sickly and ineffective that the only way the blonde would be able to beat someone in battle with it is if they laughed themselves to surrender or defeat. Of all the students in his class, the one who showed the most improvement was one of the few to fail. 
It was now up to him to assign the students who passed this year's exam their teammates to form the latest batch of Genin teams. With the advent of Naruto's failing, Haruka would have a hard time assigning teams as well as an unpleasant one. If Haruka considered his previous day was unpleasant, then his morning didn't show any signs of his problems abating. Waking up to a furious knocking on his door, Haruka was surprised to see his assistant teacher Mizuki. Hurry. We need to go to the Hokage's place right away. Naruto has stolen the scroll of seals, Mizuki said. Haruka followed Mizuki in a daze with several questions swirling around in his head, and the one which held most prominent was how does Naruto even know about the scroll of seals or where it was kept? Haruka headed towards the woods to try and locate the blonde troublemaker. A few moments later, Haruka spied his target and hopped off the branch he was on to land in front of Naruto. Sensei. Oh man. You are here already. I thought I would have some more time. Can you come back in a little while? I'll have the technique done soon. Then I can have my high tate as well right? That's what Mizuki Sensei told me, Naruto spewed the words, hoping to get some more time to practice. What are you talking about? Why did you steal the scroll? Are you learning a technique from the scroll? Hiruka asked Naruto, still perplexed about the absurdity of the situation. What? You don't know. All right. So after I failed the test last evening I didn't go back home because I didn't know how to tell Miwa-san and Shikaku-san that I failed the exam after all they did for me. That's when Mizuki-sensei found me and told me about the secret way to graduate, Naruto explained. Naruto took a deep breath before continuing, just like Mizuki-sensei said, the scroll was in the Hokage's place, and I took it. I tried to learn a jutsu from the scroll, but it is very complicated. I opened it, and the first one was a type of bunshin jutsu, and since that's the reason I failed the exam, I looked for another jutsu. Aruka sensei there are a lot of neat jutsus in here did you know that? Aruka let the boy ramble on, determined to uncover the real happenings of the situation at hand. He realized that Mizuki was the one who supplied Naruto with the information regarding the location of the scroll. So I finally found a jutsu I like the person who wrote the scroll calls a chakra beam. The principle behind the jutsu seems easy, but I cannot get past the first stage. Please give me some more time to finish it up please. Pleaded Naruto, completely unaware of the seriousness of the situation at hand. After finally getting a grasp of the situation, Iruka was about to question Naruto, but instead dived towards the boy and pushed the blonde out of the way of the incoming kunai. Unfortunately however, a few of the kunai hit the chunin, one even going painfully through his right thigh. Without even looking up to face his attacker, Iruka knew who threw the kunai. When Aruka heard Mizuki order Naruto to return the scroll to the assistant teacher, Aruka's suspicions were confirmed. Instead of focusing on his attacker, Aruka decided to protect the young boy. Naruto, run away as far as you can from here. Don't turn back. Go. Now. Aruka shouted the last bit hoping to convey the urgency through his tone. Unfortunately, Naruto did not take Aruka's heating seriously enough, and his stunned state allowed Mizuki to break the confused boy's spirit further by disclosing the secret about the Kyuubi ceiling. Naruto stood in the clearing in the woods stupidly, the only words that Mizuki spoke that registered, reverberated inside his head with a pounding so severe that he felt his head might explode soon. You are the nine-tailed demon fox. Eventually, the words registered and Naruto finally understood why all the adults and most of the kids in Kanoha treated him so harshly. Coming to terms with this new information, Naruto found himself oddly at peace, for now he knew that ubiquitous hatred of the people was justified in some sense. He did not think he was a demon fox himself, but he empathized with the villagers. He did not approve of their actions, but understood why they might have felt compelled to do as they did. However, Naruto found out that his newly found revelation came at a deadly price. As the he looked up to face Mizuki, Naruto found a large shuriken whizzing through the air, poised to impale the blonde mercilessly. Naruto closed his eyes in anticipation of the pain that would inevitably follow, and felt silly for bracing himself for far too long. The shuriken should have hit him by now. Did Mizuki sensei miss? Naruto finally opened his eyes as he felt a drop splatter on his face. Reluctantly opening his eyes, the sight in front of the blonde horrified him. Hiruka lay bent over the boy in a protective stance, playing the role of a human shield, preventing Naruto from getting hit by the shuriken, at the cost of getting himself impaled. Things were starting to get overwhelming for Naruto, and he finally took heed of Iruka's advice and bolted into the deeper section of the woods as fast as he could, skidding to a stop and hiding behind a tree when he heard the clashing of bodies onto the forest floor. Naruto kept as quiet as possible to try and learn more about the Kyuubi ceiling from conversation between his two teachers. The demon fox would do that, but Naruto is different, Iruka wheezed, the damage from the shuriken and the subsequent battle taking its toll. Those words by Aruka plucked at Naruto's heartstrings hard and unrelentingly. It was the acknowledgement he had strived so hard to receive. 
He finally got it, even if it came after the friends he made and his new family was formed, and now the person who acknowledged him was about to die. He isn't the demon fox. He is a member of the Hidden Leaf Village, said Aruka, mustering all the conviction he had, had left. He is Yuzumaki Naruto. Those last words were the final push Naruto needed to get him out of his funk. There was no way Naruto was going to be useless about it and let the man who risked his own life to protect him die without Naruto putting up a fight. Naruto sprang from his hiding place and drove a foot as hard as possible towards Mizuki's face. With Mizuki's attention on finishing off the troublesome Aruka, Naruto was able to catch the assistant instructor unawares and deal a devastating blow. Mizuki quickly brought himself to his feet to face his assailant. Naruto's bravado momentarily amused Mizuki, and so the Chunin declared he would eliminate the boy in a single stroke. Naruto was now calmer than he had been since this whole encounter had been. Mizuki had threatened to kill the man who saved his life. As Mizuki approached the boy, he noticed that Naruto had the palm of his right hand open with his fingers pointing downwards. As Mizuki took another step forward, Naruto warned his traitorous teacher, stay back. Haunting the blonde, Mizuki took another step forward, causing the boy to thrust his arm forward, rotating his wrist so as to point the open palm, with the fingers now facing upwards, towards Mizuki. Takra beam. Naruto exclaimed. Alas, the attack was to no avail. The only visible effect of the attack was the dispersion of a few leaves within a foot-long radius in front of the extended arm, as a result of the expelled chakra. Mizuki burst out into an uproarious laughter. Is that all you got? Your silly attack didn't come close to me. Mizuki continued laughing as he took purposeful, menacing steps towards the now frightened boy. I I am WW warning you. S step back. Naruto sputtered. He had not even come close to the mastering the jutsu, but in his desperation it seemed his only option. Mizuki strode forward with confidence, and Naruto's fear and anger rose with each step Mizuki took. As Mizuki placed himself mere couple feet away from Naruto, he tried the attack again, yelling its name to echo the feelings inside of him, Chakra Beam. This time the amount of chakra imbued in the attack was significantly greater and equally out of control. Mizuki was blown away by the impact of the arm thrust, as a volatile chakra-enhanced fist impacted against Mizuki's gut. The force of the blow sent the Chunin to a nearby tree, his head pinging off the bark, knocking Naruto's aggressor into the land of the unconscious. Naruto. Come here, Haruka meekly called out. Naruto had only now realized that his bravado was all for the sake of protecting his beloved teacher, and immediately ran to his side to check up on him. Naruka stopped Naruto's panic by grabbing onto one of his wrists and asking the boy to close his eyes. Complying with his sensei's request, Naruto closed his eyes momentarily until he heard Haruka speak again. Congratulations on graduating Naruto. Haruka said, a smile on his face as he spoke to the blonde. Naruto felt an unfamiliar weight on his head and realized that the missing hightate on his teacher's head was the cause of the unfamiliar weight on his head. Tackling his instructor in joy, Naruto hugged Aruka until the older man cried out in pain from the pressure being put on his newly acquired injuries. We need to return that scroll back, Naruto, Aruka told the boy, giving Naruto the cue to let him lose from his embrace. The Chunin and newly minted Genin walked towards the Hokage Tower, glad that the ordeals of the day had finally come to a close. When they finally entered the Hokage's office, Naruto met someone he had not seen in the morning hours ever. Yuga-sensei. How come you are here? asked a curious Naruto. Instead of getting a reply from Yugao, here is an address Naruto. Naruto-kun, you have had quite an eventful 12 hours haven't you? questioned the Hokage. On the way from the woods to the Hokage Tower, Naruto was told about the significance of the scroll he had stolen and the implications of his actions. Naruto had the decency to look embarrassed in front of his commanding officer. I saw what happened with the crystal ball. I am not mad at you for what happened. But I am curious how do you feel now that you know the truth. The Hokage finished. Naruto scratched the back of his neck as he thought carefully about his answer. To be honest, I haven't had much time to process the whole thing. I do understand why a lot of the villagers glare at me like they do now. Hiruka-sensei explained it to me though I am only its jailer, I am not the Kayubi. That is very mature of you Naruto, I am proud of you. Any other questions? Inquired the Hokage. I do have one more. Hiruka-sensei told me I should ask you, as he was young when the attack happened and doesn't remember all the details. Why was I selected for the ceiling? Naruto asked, since Aruka had offered no answer on the subject matter before. For the Kayubi to be sealed effectively, it needed to be contained in the body of a newly born child. If you recall, the Kayubi attacked Kanoha on the same day you were born. You were the most ideal candidate for the sealing, Hiruzen chose to answer with a half-truth. So what about my parents? Did they not want me? Is that why they offered me up for the sealing? Asked Naruto, his thoughts turning darker as he could not help but feel the betrayal. Quite the contrary Naruto-kun. 
I am sure your parents loved you very much, but unfortunately they died trying to protect the village from the Kayubi. I am sorry you never got to meet them, here is an answered. It was the truth, it just wasn't the truth with all the details. Not fully understanding the finer workings of a seal strong enough to contain a tailed beast, Naruto accepted the story as the truth. He was curious about the identity of his parents, but that was for another day. While he was pondering over the information he learnt over the past few hours, Naruto saw Aruka hand over a document to the Hokage. Hiruzen studied the document carefully and nodded in approval to himself as he finished reading the document. Naruto also noticed that during the entire time he had been in the office, Yugao had not spoken once. Naruto, as you know, the students that pass the academy exam are placed into provisional three-man teams who will become a genin squad, the Hokage began. While Laruka has given you credit for passing, the initial teams had already been devised prior to your unofficial graduation, here is unfinished. Does that mean I am not a genin even though I've passed? Asked Naruto. For the first time since being in the office, Naruto heard Yuga speak. No Naruto. It means that you haven't been assigned a team and a jonin sensei. Genin squads aren't the only way forward to newly graduated academy students. Though it is very rare, jonin or well-established chunin could offer their services to take upon a single student under an apprenticeship. Naruto considered Yugao's words carefully, and he was fairly sure he had assimilated the information correctly. I accept. Naruto shouted in response to the unasked question. Yugao and the Hokage laughed while Aruka looked on perplexed. Usually, a graduate is supposed to ask his or her superior if they would like to have an apprentice, Naruto, Yugao chided. Aruka put the pieces together and considering the familiarity in the relationship between Yugao and Naruto, Aruka established that they had had prior contact. While he did not know on what premise the relationship was established, Aruka did recall Naruto refer to Yugao as sensei when they first entered the office. Aruka finally voiced his thoughts, Hokage-sama, how long have Yugao-san and Naruto known each other, and what has Yugao-san been instructing Naruto in? Naruto answered for the Hokage, jubilant at the prospect of having Yugao as his instructor in an official capacity. This meant no more late-night training sessions. They would train all day. I am going to be the greatest swordsman ever. Yugao sensei has been teaching me for almost a year and a half now. She teaches me kinjutsu and some basic training as well, answered Naruto, restlessness causing him to bounce on his heels, bobbing up and down like a buoy in the open seas. I never would have thought Naruto would be interested in kinjutsu training. This extra training does explain his increased speed, it would be more than useful for a kinjutsu user, thought Aruka to himself. Aruka was distracted from his musings when he heard the Hokage speak. Naruto, you and Yuga-chan can discuss the details of your training later. I think you should go home now. Miwa-chan and Shikaku-san were quite upset when you didn't go home last night. Don't worry, I have told them what happened, but I am sure they would like to have you home. Besides, they don't know you are a genin yet. Why don't you go share the good news? The reality of the situation had just hit him, and it hit him like a ton of bricks. Naruto had not even told his adoptive parents that he failed. He had not even gone home. Shikamaru would have known that Naruto failed, but he would not be able to answer questions about his whereabouts over the past 12 hours. Guzo? Naruto cursed. I have got to go. I'll talk to you later Yuga-sensei. Thank you Aruka-sensei. Bye old man. Naruto blurted out before he turned around and sprinted to the Nara compound as fast as his legs could carry him. It had been three months since Naruto and the rest of his class graduated to become the latest batch of Konoha Genin, and in that time, Naruto often returned home with his fair share of bruises. Shikamaru had often complained about how troublesome being a genin was, what with all the glorified chores that they were instructed to do. However, under Yugao's guidance Naruto spent more time training than any of his colleagues and doing fewer missions as a consequence. If he was fair to himself, Naruto didn't particularly mind being given the short end of the stick with respect to his share of mission allocations. On the few D-rank missions he had done and the many more he had heard from Shikamaru about his team, Team 10, Naruto could not fathom how any of these missions could help better a ninja. They were chores, and Naruto was glad not to be running about wasting time doing the same. However, being under Yugao as an apprentice meant that Naruto had barely seen his friend since the mishap with Mizuki at the end of the last year. In fact, he had only told Shikamaru about his graduation, and that was solely due to the fact that they lived in the same house. Naruto had been trained into the ground, and on some days that expression took a literal meaning as well. Yugao was adamant that Naruto would have to improve his basics and his abilities as a ninja before they undertook any higher level missions. This was motivation enough for Naruto, as he had no intentions on doing cumbersome chores for lazy village folk. Naruto's initial training focused on dodging ability and kinjutsu katas. Yugao had painfully drilled into Naruto the importance of being nimble and the advantages of dodging as opposed to blocking. If you dodge my sword swing, you are already in a position of favor. 
missing your strike could lead you to be off balance, making you an easier target to strike down. Read your opponent's body to help predict where and when the strike will come from. Then use whatever little is in the space in between your ears and chose a direction that is most favorable for you to dodge towards, Yu Gao had said, adding emphasis to her point, whilst dodging a wild strike from Naruto in retaliation to the insult and poking her own Bakken firmly up his backside to illustrate an example of her advice. Naruto had not grown much physically over the past three months, but his development was more visible on the training grounds as opposed to on the streets. He had become faster, significantly so as well if he were to consider Yu Gao's proclamation, and that was more than good enough for him. Naruto's increase in speed was a result of some brutal training that involved adding weights to his limbs and then training as normal. But small increments in the weight, he had seen no improvement after two and a half months, but when instructed to spar against Yu Gao with the training weights off, Naruto had realized what an effective training method it was and was only stopped from increasing the weights on his body after being told about the pitfalls of overdoing the training regimen. Naruto had not known to experience any pain as a result of his training in a long while and was confused. He had often asked Yugao why he healed from his scrapes and bruises so quickly, and the only answer he got led to him questioning the presence of the beast sealed up within him. As Naruto and Yugao headed up to pick up their mission for the week, Naruto decided to ask the Hokage about the side effects of having a massive chakra construct sealed within oneself. To be honest Naruto, not much has been documented about the abilities that the tailed beast bestow upon their hosts, but there is some evidence that there are certain benefits. The first Jinchuriki of the Kyubi was known to have an innate ability to sense negative emotions in their surroundings. Enhanced healing could very well be another gift as a result of being a Jinchuriki. Both quite useful to a ninja, I might add, Hiruzen told Naruto before he had had the chance to issue the master and apprentice pair a mission. Naruto looked up pleadingly at Yugao, the silent message was clear. Please not another D-rank. Yugao would not offer Naruto any consolation as she just shrugged in response to his look. At that very moment, an overtly out-of-breath looking Chunin entered the mission room. Okage-sama, we have an urgent message from Kakashi-san requested backup for his mission. The message was brought in by one of his hounds, said the Chunin, handing over a scroll to the Hokage, as he made every effort to catch his breath. The Hokage read the message and raised his eyebrows in alarm. Team 7's encounter with the Demon Brothers all but ensured that he had sent an ill-prepared team to wave. Kakashi had requested the assistance of an additional Jonin or Chunin, in anticipation of greater threats in the future. The Hokage looked up from the request scroll and looked at the present company. But the Demon Brothers' involvement this C-rank mission had gone up to a B-rank mission, and if Kakashi thought that stronger opponents could surface, that would mean that the Genin he sent in previously would be hard-pressed to return to Konoha if multiple strong ninja were involved. Unfortunately, his forces were spread fairly thin, and one of his most capable ninjas stood right in front of him. Hiruzen was in an ethical dilemma, he could send Yugao in for reinforcements, but that would mean having to send Naruto in as well. However the mission was clearly above the levels of a fresh out of the academy genin. Failure to send in reinforcements quickly enough however, could lead to the loss of some promising genin and one already very accomplished jonin. Time was of the utmost importance, and Hiruzen made a decision he hoped he would not live to regret. Team Yugao, you are to reinforce Team 7 on their mission in wave. You will leave right away as they have a day and a half's head start. Team 7 have already had an encounter with the Demon Brothers, and it is possible that they will be up against stronger ninja. The mission is a B-rank with a high possibility that it will be upgraded to an A-rank. Dismissed. Naruto was shocked beyond words. He had hoped he would get a simple C-rank mission, an escort mission, at least that way he would get to see what lay beyond the massive walls that protected Konoha. This was beyond his scope, but he knew he needed to act. Sakura and Sasuke were in Team 7, he had learned from Shikamaru, and he would be damned if he didn't help them out to the best of his limited abilities. As Yugao and Naruto left the Hokage Tower, Naruto's mind was a jumble of emotions and thoughts, but he was sensible enough to hear a few words from Yugao on their way out lose the weights grab, your pack main gates in 10 minutes. Naruto didn't want to throw the weights away in reckless abandon, so he made his way to the Nara household as quickly as possible and rid of his weights, grabbing a ninja pack and sprinting back towards the main gates. Yugao was already waiting for Naruto at the gate and waited just a few seconds before she took off tree hopping away from Konoha, knowing Naruto would follow. It took Naruto almost a quarter mile out to realize that he felt as light as a feather while maneuvering through the trees following his sensei who set a quick yet just about manageable pace. Removing the weights had had an astonishing effect on his pace and he was glad for it considering the time they had had to make up. He had a ton of questions to ask but would focus on covering as much ground as possible for the time being. He had a day and a half's worth of ground to cover, and even if the members of Team 7 and their charge were walking, that was still a lot of mileage. 
As Naruto caught up to Yugao so that they were traveling side by side, Yugao spoke up. Team 7 have been sent on an escort mission to Wave Country to protect a bridge builder until he and his crew can finish building the bridge. It was supposed to be a simple C-rank mission until the Demon Brothers got themselves involved. The Demon Brothers are a pair of Kurigakur ninja who are notorious for the teamwork and their use of poisonous weapons. We might pass them on our way there, but we won't be stopping to ask questions. Kakashi's scroll has outlined that they were tied up so that they could be picked up for an arrest. We are to catch up with Team 7 and provide backup until they can finish the mission. This also means that if I am not around, Kakashi-sensei will be your superior that means you do as he tells you to unless I am around. Understood. Naruto didn't speak, but simply nodded to confirm that he had heard what Yugao had said and that he would obey Kakashi's orders in her absence. As they continued the rest of their travel in silence, Naruto reflected back to his progress with the chakra beam technique or in his case, a lack of progress. With Yugao stressing on kenjutsu training, Naruto had not had a lot of time to practice the technique he had learned from the scroll of seals. His chakra control was quite abysmal, and he had never been able to replicate the results he had gotten when he managed to hit Mizuki hard enough to knock him out. He would have to improve his control to improve as a ninja in any case, better start sooner rather than later. They had covered a lot of ground since the time they had been traveling and were about to stop when they heard an incessant cursing. Yugao signaled Naruto to stop, and he fell in behind his sensei. As Yugao and Naruto proceeded with caution, Yugao was pleasantly surprised to see the infamous demon brothers tied to a tree helpless to their own cause. Yugao signaled Naruto to continue following her and turned around to speak to him. Bakashi sent his message after the encounter with demon brothers. Since they have a civilian client with them, they would have undoubtedly stopped for the night shortly after and left in the morning. If they continued walking, we should be able to meet up with them soon enough. We have been running non-stop for almost six hours now. Do you need a break? Yugao asked, concerned about Naruto. She was sure he had never had to run so hard for so long. Naruto thought about it for a while and said, do you think we can catch up within a few hours? Yugao nodded in affirmation. Then we can take the break when we meet them. We are their reinforcements, if something happened to Sakura and Sasuke while we were taking a break, it would defeat our purpose. Okay, but pace yourself. If we are needed right away then it won't be useful if you are out of steam. Here have a soldier pill and a ration bar. It should return most of your lost energy. Just don't focus on the taste, said Yugao, tossing a small bar and a little bag towards the blonde. Naruto almost spat out the ration bar, but managed to keep the contents in. He would need his energy if his friends were in trouble. The soldier pill, which Naruto found in the small bag, went down a lot better, and he felt instantaneously refreshed. As Yugao ate a ration bar and a soldier pill as well, and the pair continued on towards the location of Team 7, picking up the pace slightly after getting some food in. Team 7 had decided to continue on with a mission to help the now sober bridge builder Tazuna after he had explained the state of affairs of his hometown. Kakashi was weary of doing so, but the adamant nature of his students both confused and pleased him. However, he could not afford to just indulge his students without providing support for them. He was a more than capable ninja, but if an opponent of greater caliber than the Demon Brothers showed up, he would be hard-pressed to both fight them off and defend his students and their charge. As Team 7 walked along, Kakashi wondered if his hound had been able to drop the message off in time and if suitable reinforcements were sent. Tazuna had said that once they crossed the river, they would be very close to his house. As the boat crossed the narrow strait away from Fire Country and into Wave Country, Kakashi and the rest of his team marveled at the sight of the near-finished bridge. It was quite the spectacle indeed and if finished, would ruin Gato's stranglehold on the economy of the tiny island country. Whilst walking towards Tazuna's house, Kakashi could not help but feel as though his little group was being watched. Paranoia was a gift and curse to a ninja. Suspecting everything or listening to your gut often helps save your head. However, falling prey to excessive paranoia often led to losing one's mental facilities as well. Kakashi had been in enough battles and honed his senses to belong to the former group. Listening to his instinct, Kakashi yelled for his group to drop to the ground and for once his team obeyed his orders without question. It was quite a miracle that the members of Team 7 did as they were asked without complaining, the massive cleaver had passed by their heads with just inches to spare. Kakashi recognized the man perched on top of the hilt of the sword instantly Zabuza Mamachi, also known as Demon of the Hidden Mist. Edo has hired a group of defected Mist Ninja to deal with Tizuna, and when the Demon Brothers failed, it was up to the big fish to finish up the job. Absolutely great, thought Kakashi. Kakashi fraud off Zabuza to the best of his abilities, while entrusting the safety of Tizuna to his genin. With Zabuza's preference for fighting from within a mist, the battle was nerve-wracking, and Kakashi had found himself kicked into the water. Before he could comprehend what was happening, Kakashi found himself trapped in a dense fear of water. 
To make things worse, Zabuza had just created a water clone to finish off his team and Tazuna. Things had gone from bad to worse immediately. Urging his students to run away, Kakashi hoped they would listen for a second time without complaint. Unfortunately, he was not as lucky as Sasuke and Ranmaru, the third genin in his team, attempted to fight against the water clone in a desperate bid to free Kakashi. Ranmaru Kazu was not exactly an exceptional ninja. In fact he would have not even been on this team if Naruto had managed to pass the exam. With Naruto failing to do so, Ranmaru was placed on the genin team with Sasuke and Sakura. However, Ranmaru was a bullish ninja and was adamant that their chances for survival were far increased with Kakashi outside the water prison. But the clever use of shuriken, Ranmaru and Sasuke had managed to free Kakashi from his water prison. Kakashi was enraged and decided to remind Zabuza exactly why he was called the copycat ninja. As the sounds of screams reached their ears, Naruto and Yuga looked at each other and quickened their pace towards the source of the noise. From afar Naruto could see that two identical men were fighting against Team 7. One holding the man he had briefly seen in the alley outside the bar all those months ago, in a sphere of water, and another fighting off Sasuke and one of his classmates he was not well acquainted with. It's a clone, Naruto realized as he moved closer towards the scene of the action. When Yugao and Naruto finally arrived, they witnessed a huge clash between two dragons made of water. Within seconds a massive wall of water crashed upon the ninja who had made the clone earlier and knocked him out against a tree. Naruto landed next to Sakura, startling her out of her wits. Naruto, what are you doing here? Is that a high tate on your forehead? But you failed the exams, how do you have a high tate? Sakura shot off her questions as she recovered from her shock. Later Naruto, Yugao instructed. The arrival of Naruto and Yugao had distracted the members of Team 7, and at that precise moment, two senbin pierced through Zabuza's neck. Just as quickly as the group was distracted by Naruto's arrival, they whipped their heads around to see a dead Zabuza laying on the floor. Bakashi followed the path of the thrown projectiles back to its source and found a ninja that was most definitely a hunter ninja from the mist. Makes sense I guess. Zabuza left mist after his failed assassination attempt of the fourth Mizukage. It stands to reason that the Mizukage would send a group out to kill him. But a single ninja that can't be much older than my own genin. Kakashi pondered to himself. As the ninja disappeared with Zabuza's body, Kakashi was pleased to note that his reinforcements had arrived. Yuga Yuzuki. That's good, she is a very capable jonin. But what is Naruto doing here? Just as Yuga rushed over to meet with Kakashi, he proceeded to meet the forest floor face first. Need to train harder, the drain from using the Sharingan is still too much to handle. Yugao assumed command of the group as she helped carry Kakashi towards Tazuna's house. She listened to the group around her talk so that she could piece together as much information about the proceedings as possible. As she listened to Sakura and Ranmaru describe the events as best as possible, she noticed Naruto had dragged Sasuke separately and could just about make sense of what the two were talking about. Sasuke, about that ninja that you were just fighting. Before you forced him to release your sensei, there were two of them. It was a bunch and wasn't it? Yup, but it wasn't a regular bunch and we learnt about in the academy. This one was made of water and it was very solid. So, I guess it wasn't anything like the bunch and we learnt in the academy. Bunchens that aren't merely used to distract. Why didn't they teach us that in the academy? Naruto wondered. He idly mused if he would be able to figure out that for the examination or if he would fail that as well. Naruto was pulled out of his musings when he heard Sasuke speak again. Naruto. Want to tell me why you are here with a jonin, with a high tate on your head as well? I am guessing Sakura will want to know the answer to that as well. I'll tell you guys when we are all together because I don't want to repeat myself. It's a good story, I promise, said Naruto as he headed towards Yugao, who had beckoned him to help carry Kakashi as they moved towards Tazuna's house. I am proud of you Naruto. We covered that distance in great time, and although we didn't help much today, we are here, and now Kakashi can rest easy. Naruto beamed at the praise and was hoping there would be some food waiting at Tazuna's house, as he was famished and quite ready to join the masked jonin in a similar state of consciousness. If there are any writers out there reading my story, could you please tell me how to add a line to separate mine from the rest of the story? It's on my Word document, but it doesn't pop up when I post a new chapter online. What could I be doing wrong? I hope you enjoy this installment of Sword Shadow. Zori. Waraji. It's time to pay a visit to that blasted demon, Gato shouted at the closed door of his office. Immediately, the two men, who served as bodyguards to the diminutive smuggler, entered the room. The two men that entered the room had completely different appearances, but they both served as samurai from the land of waves. Waraji, the taller of the two, had his hair in three parts and wore an eye patch over his right eye. The left side of his torso was heavily tattooed and he wore a kimono that covered only the bottom half of his body, exposing the bandages that were wrapped around his abdomen. 
In contrast, Zori wore an unremarkable blue jacket and a purple hat that covered a large part of his pale blue hair. Both men carried their swords on their hips and could be called into action at a moment's notice. The two men held the door of the office open, allowing the bespectacled man to cross into the hallway. Zori and Waraji followed a few paces behind, intent on keeping their meal ticket alive. As Gato entered the room in which Abusa was being cared for, he made no effort to hide his disdain for the former member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen of the Mist. You claim yourself to be the devil, and yet you cannot beat a group of genin led by one jonin. Pathetic. Gato exclaimed, spewing spittle as he voiced his unbridled dislike for the turn of events. It had taken a while to gain complete control of the shipping routes in and around the land of waves. For all intents and purposes, the whole region was under his control, but the damnable bridge builder posed a risk to all his power and money. As he lay, Zabuza presented no risk to him while he was under the protection of Zori and Waraji, but that child that was caring for the devil was proving to be a thorn on his side as well. After the quick confrontation between Haku and Gato, the shipping magnate left but was adamant to get the last word in. While I am paying you, you belong to me Zabuza. Don't you dare forget that. You will eliminate the bridge builder and if I think you are incapable of doing so, I will send my own ninja to ensure what you started is finished, Gato spat out from the threshold of the room. Turning swiftly on his heel, he left the room, Zori and Waraji following closely behind in silence. Azuna and the group of Kanohan ninja that accompanied him had reached his house just under an hour after their confrontation with Zabuza. Kakashi was laying down on a futon in one of the rooms as directed to by Tsunami, Tazuna's daughter, while he recuperated his energy following his battle with the former Mist Ninja. After depositing Kakashi on the futon, Yugao joined Naruto and his friends who had huddled together in the living room, demanding the details of his presence and how he had become a genin of Konoha when he had clearly left the academy on graduation day without a high tate. And then the jutsu finally worked and I knocked Mizuki-sensei out. Then Aruka sensei gave me his high tate and told me that I had done enough to pass, Naruto said, beaming at the recollection of the memory. It started as a horrible day, the night was even harder, but the whole ordeal ended up as a bright memory. For the longest time, Sasuke and Sakura did not say anything. The story they heard was so absurd, but if anyone was part of such a bizarre story, they both knew that it could only be Naruto. Ranmaru Kazu was the third genin member of Team 7. His strengths focused on thrown weaponry, and he was quite headstrong. However, when it came to his class grades, he was on the other end of the spectrum from Sasuke and Sakura, which meant, with the failure of Naruto in the graduation test, he became the final component of Team 7. Ranmaru stood as tall as Sasuke and wore a dark green shirt and black pants, outfitted with a pair of black ninja sandals. Like Naruto and Sasuke, Ranmaru wore his high tate across his forehead. Ranmaru was the first to speak up after Naruto narrated his story. I don't believe you. If you graduated and become a genin, who is in your team huh? Why did you only come with a jonin? Where is the rest of your team? Ranmaru asked Naruto. Sasuke and Sakura both turned to face Ranmaru when he had spoken, and when they listened to him, they had to admit he had brought up some good points. It was true, Naruto was here, with only a jonin, and when Kakashi had explained the importance of teamwork during their genin examination, they were sure that all genin would be split up into teams of three. As the genin of Team 7 looked towards Naruto for an explanation, they were caught unawares of a presence behind them until she began to speak. Naruto is my apprentice and will continue to be so until either one of us dies or he is promoted to Chunin, Yugao had said from right behind Sakura, causing the pink-haired girl to jump out of her skin at the unexpected arrival of Naruto's sensei. An apprentice? Sasuke questioned. Yugao explained to the members of Team 7 that in exceptional circumstances, Genin may be taken on under apprenticeships. And as you can all agree, the conditions that surrounded Naruto's graduation was easily considered exceptional. It was hard to argue that fact a confrontation with a traitorous former academy teacher, stealing a forbidden scroll and a near-death experience of their own teacher, did indeed make for an exceptional graduation. Yugao san if Naruto is your apprentice, what area of the shinobi arts is Naruto training in? Sakura had asked, drawing the attention of the two boys of Team 7 to the still-standing former Anbu. He, Naruto giggled childishly as he stood up theatrically, nearly toppling the little table that stood between the four genin. Team 7, I, Naruto Uzumaki, am going to be Kanoha's greatest swordsman, Naruto shouted, jerking a thumb towards his chest for emphasis. But Kakashi still passed out in the room upstairs, Tsunami and Tazuna joined the five Kanoha ninja for dinner, where the group split up into several small conversations Sasuke and Naruto, discussing Zabuza's use of Mizubunshin, water clones, during their earlier fight, Sakura talking to Yugao about her experience with Kenjutsu and Ranmaru, talking to Tazuna and Tsunami about the land of waves. 
Inner was progressing smoothly until Inari, Tsunami's son, walked in and expressed his disapproval of a bunch of kids, hoping to save Wave Country from Gato's reign of terror. There's no such thing as heroes. Inari shouted, directing the large majority of his ire towards the genin. You guys should just go back home. You can't beat Gato. You're just kids. Why you? Naruto began, determined to silence the snot-nosed brat for the insult they were subject to, only to be held back by Sasuke. Naruto was about to chastise Sasuke until he saw the look in the raven-haired boy's eyes. Naruto looked from Sasuke to Inari and saw the tears welling up in Inari's eyes. Huffing, Naruto sat down back at his table as he watched Inari run back to his room. The next morning, Kakashi finally woke up and after filling in Yugao with the happenings of the mission they both came down the stairs to meet their respective charges. Yugao and I were discussing the mission, and we both realized that there is a strong possibility that Tsubuza might not be dead, and that the ninja that disappeared with Tsubuza's body might be his accomplice, rather than a ninja of the mist, Kakashi told the group of genin, without revealing any of the emotions he himself felt on the matter. As expected, the genin all wore looks of shock and confusion. Kakashi-sensei, Tsubuza got attacked with two senbans to the neck. How would he have survived that attack? Sakura asked her sensei. Kakashi discussed the roles of the hunter ninja and their responsibilities as protectors of their village's secrets. What puzzled me the most was the fact that the hunter ninja did not destroy Zabuza's body at the scene and instead chose to disappear with it. It is quite possible to knock someone out by hitting the precise points of their body. Zabuza could be back soon we have to train ourselves to be able to fight against him, Kakashi finished, fixing the genin with a serious look to emphasize the severity of the situation. Don't worry Kakashi-san. You have Yuga sensei and me this time. Naruto said. If we can have reinforcements, what makes you think Gato won't send someone else with Zabuza to even things up? Yuga asked Naruto. The blonde had no answer to Yuga's question and so chose to address Kakashi instead. So what are we training on? Yuga and Kakashi led the genin towards a clearing in the woods behind Tazuna's house. They had agreed that Naruto would need training in chakra control as well, since it was an important aspect of all shinobi's development. As Yugao demonstrated to the four genin how to go about with completing the chakra control exercise, Kakashi explained the principles of the exercise and its importance. A ninja in battle will need to channel chakra for a variety of reasons. For example, throwing around jutsu while fighting on top of water requires a great deal of control and ability. If you were solely focusing on staying on top of the water, how could you expect to fight against an opponent? Kakashi explained. What Yugao is doing now is one of the most basic forms of chakra control exercises. Master this technique and you will be one step closer to becoming a better ninja. Knowing exactly how much chakra is needed for a jutsu ensures that it is most effective and doesn't waste any of your stores abundant as they might be, Kakashi finished, looking at Naruto as he finished his last statement. With the demonstration over, Yuga tossed the four gen and a kunai each to mark their progress with the exercises on the trees they selected. Within moments, Sakura had managed to cover significant ground on her control exercise and quickly reached a high branch on the tree, surprising everyone at the speed with which she completed the exercise. Yugao and Kakashi shared equally astonished looks on their faces as Kakashi commended the girl of the group on her progress. Well done Sakura. Continue with the exercise to develop your stamina. Tomorrow you will be on guard duty with Yugao and Tazuna. Sakura beamed with pride at having completed the chakra control exercise first, but within the hour, she was sweating bullets as she finally collapsed in a heap, unable to carry on any further. Ranmaru and Sasuke were doing admirably well with each run taking them closer to the top. They were panting hard as well with the exertion, but it was Naruto that surprised her. The blonde's progress was achingly slow, but as soon as he landed he was back up, running towards the tree. As she saw Naruto flip back off the tree after his latest attempt, she watched as he walked over to her instead of running up against the tree. Na, Sakura-chan, could you give me some pointers? I don't seem to be making much progress, and both Sasuke and Ranmaru seem miles ahead at this point, Naruto asked Sakura. Sakura outlined what she learned during the course of the exercise and made suggestions as per her observations of Naruto's attempt so far. Thanking the pink-haired girl, Naruto went headed towards the tree he had marred with kunai slashes. As dusk approached, Sakura left the boys to their own devices, she idly noticed that Naruto was catching up to the other boys. When it was time for dinner, the three boys returned to Tazuna's house, famished to the point that they were barely able to drag themselves past the door and into the house. As soon as they were able to shovel some food down their gut, the boys began eating at a more relaxed pace, and so conversation picked up around the table, after the other members of the table stopped staring at the boys' antics. Spying a photo frame on the wall opposite the table, Ranmaru noticed that the picture within the photo was torn away at one side, effectively removing a person from the picture. 
Curious as the reason why, Ranmaru asked Azuna what had happened. Azuna told the Kanoha ninja about Kaiza, Tsunami's late husband, with a mixture of sadness and pride. Midway during the story, Inari stormed off to his room, visibly upset with having to recount the events that destroyed his faith in heroes. It had been close to a week since the tree climbing exercises began, and Sasuke and Ranmaru had finished mastering the exercises a few days before. Ranmaru and Sasuke had joined Sakura at the bridge to protect Azuna, while Yugao oversaw Naruto's training in the chakra climbing exercise. It was understandable that Naruto needed more time than the others to finish the task. He was not dedicating his entire training time solely to the chakra control exercise. On alternate days, Yugao would pull Naruto away from the group to ensure that Naruto's sword skills were not getting rusty. It had been two days since Yugao and Kakashi explained the chakra control exercises to the genin. While Sakura had finished the exercise on the first day, she would spend a few hours in the morning continuing to build her stamina. None of the boys could match the height she could climb on the tree, but Sasuke was steadily catching, followed closely by both Naruto and Ranmaru. As the genin left Azuna's house to fulfill their respective duties, Naruto was pulled back by Yugao, you are training with me today, she said curtly. As Naruto followed Yugao into the woods, she arrived at a clearing where she stopped and turned around to face her charge. As Kakashi and I suspect, the masked hunter ninja they had an encounter with earlier might very well be a member of Zabuza's team. If that is the case, I need to train you better so that you can hold your own against him, Yuga said, as she pulled out a scroll from a pocket in her jacket. It's time you got your own sword, Naruto. You have improved tremendously over the last few months, and this opponent is the real deal. He is probably attacking with the intent to kill, which means we can't be charging up against him with a bakken, Yugao continued, releasing a little chakra into the storage scroll and catching the scabbard that popped out of the scroll. As Naruto processed the words, his eyes bugged out of their sockets when he saw the scroll release the scabbard. As Yugao unsheathed the blade within the scabbard, Naruto noticed that it was a pure black sword, from pommel to point. The blade was slender and slightly curved with a square guard and a significantly large grip. Naruto recognized the single-edged blade instantaneously a katana, Naruto thought to himself. Yugao took a few practice swings with the blade and then handed it over to Naruto. It's a standard Anbu katana very light and extremely durable. It doesn't reflect a lot of light and makes it quite a lethal weapon for use with its razor-sharp blade. This is no toy Naruto, you can cut yourself if you are not careful. We don't want that, we want to cut the enemy. Yugao finished with an exclamation. Naruto took the blade reverently from Yugao and studied it. Holding the scabbard in his left hand, he took a few practice swings with the sword. The sword had the same length as the Bakken he was using, but weighed a fraction less than the training sword. Naruto realized that regardless of the encounter, he was bound to inherit this sword sooner or later. It was so remarkably similar to his training sword that he realized that Yugao had meant for him to be a katana user at least primarily. The grip was made with black-colored leather that sat comfortably within Naruto's palm. Naruto swung the sword in both the single and the double-handed grip. It was not too heavy to handle with the single-handed grip, and Naruto was pleased to note that. Go through your katas, all of them. Get used to the sword, its feel, weight and balance. We will be in battle soon, and I could ill afford to have you in a fight with an unknown weapon, Yugao instructed Naruto. Yugao scrutinized every movement the blonde made as he moved through the routine she had instructed him in, slowly at first, and picking up pace, once he had assured himself to be at ease with the weapon. Yugao was pleased as Naruto showed improvements in his movements as he acclimatized himself with the sword. After a couple hours of going through the motions, Yugao beckoned Naruto to join her for a light lunch before they recommenced their training. Naruto placed the sword in the black scabbard and tied the strap across his hip, allowing the sword to be drawn from the left side of his body. As they ate their fill, Naruto and Yugao spoke about the impending battle and their thoughts on the issue. Sakura and Kakashi told me that the boy that works with Zabuza uses Senban with deadly accuracy. It stands to reason that you will be fighting against him with or without help. If you do fight against him, it is critical that you are not hit by any of those Senban. If he could put Zabuza in a temporary death state from a great distance from a tree, I am sure he could do some damage to you, Yugao told Naruto, unsure whether the large gulp from the blonde was a consequence of swallowing the food he had just ingested or an involuntary reaction to the fear she had put into him. You are fast Naruto, but that ninja with Zabuza might be even faster. We can't discount that possibility, so we are going to spend the rest of the day training you to dodge projectiles. If you can't dodge one of them, we have to make sure you block them at the very least, Yugao continued, satisfied when she saw Naruto nod in acceptance with a renewed fire in his eyes. This is why she had picked the boy to train, he had a tenacity that was not found in most his age. His will to survive was unparalleled unsurprising, considering the torment of abuse he was subject to for the vast majority of his life. 
As they finished up their meal, Yu Gao spent the next half hour instructing Naruto on how to optimize his movements and use his sword to block in a way where he would not lose sight of his opponent but still managed to avoid being hit by whatever projectile was thrown at him. Having digested the food, both master and student began training. Yu Gao began with throwing kunai at the boy from directly in front of him, adding in shuriken at random intervals to confuse him with the changes in trajectory and speed. By the end of the day, Naruto was severely bruised, but he had managed to dodge the majority of the projectiles, as well as block most of the few that he was unable to skip past. It was the ones that he was unable to both dodge and block that were responsible for his current state of affairs. However, Naruto and Yugao both noticed that the benefit of having a large chakra monster in one's belly was the amazing regenerative powers Naruto had healed from most of the scrapes and was raring to continue until Yugao decided that overexertion at this stage could be quite detrimental to the blonde's training. Naruto had left Izuna's house at the advent of dawn to get some training in the chakra control exercises before he was due to train with Yugao again. He had made good progress with the sword, and the few spars he had had with Yugao lasted more than a minute before Yugao had struck him with a conclusive blow, which was a lot longer than his spars in Konoha. It's a thinking man's battle Naruto remembered Yugao's words as he ran up against a newly selected tree, the previous one was so littered with marks that it was hard to recognize if he made any progress on it or not. Naruto was upset that Sasuke had finished the exercise well before him, but understood that he was training to become a swordsman and had to prioritize accordingly. Sasuke had a plethora of questions for Kakashi the man was clearly not an Achiha, but was still in possession of a Sharingan eye. The trait did not exist outside of the Achiha clan, and to the best of his recollections, surely did not develop in just a solitary eye. So how does Kakashi sensei have that eye in the first place? Unfortunately for Sasuke, the tree climbing exercise and the subsequent guard duty on the bridge did not exactly cater for a question and answer session with his Jonin sensei. He would have to wait until they were back in Konoha. In any case the information he would gain would have more meaning when he had unlocked his own Sharingan eye. Sasuke had noticed that Naruto had gotten a lot better with his overall skills than when they had left the academy, but that was to be expected with any genin. What intrigued Sasuke about the blonde was his commitment to his swordsmanship. Naruto trained with his jonin sensei, Yugao, every other day and came back with scrapes and bruises all over his body, but was raring for another session as soon as possible. It was blatantly obvious that the boy enjoyed his training the delight in Naruto's eyes as he outlined his training regime and exercises over the dinner table conveyed the message loud and clear. Truth be told, Sasuke was a little bit jealous about Naruto's situation. He had a master whose sole focus was on improving her charge's ability as a ninja. Sasuke was an avenger he had had this path chosen for him by his brother all those years ago. He had sworn to himself that he would get good enough to beat Itachi, and Sasuke could definitely appreciate the benefits of having a personal instructor. Despite the jealousy, Sasuke felt no animosity towards Naruto. The boy had had his share of rotten luck from all he had heard from Sakura and the others, and he deserved this kind twist of fate. Sasuke had isolated himself ever since the massacre and rarely met his friends when he was younger. He did not feel comfortable explaining his situation with any of his peers and had accordingly chosen not to do so, alluding to his plight with the barest of details when Kakashi had asked him to introduce himself to the members of Team 7 on the rooftop of the academy building the day after graduation. Sasuke correctly assumed that Naruto had felt at ease with the troubled raven-haired boy as well. Since the meeting in Wave was their first since graduation, Naruto had spent all his free time discussing a myriad of matters almost exclusively with him. While most of the conversation focused on shinobi matters like improving with the tree climbing technique or Zabuza's use of the water clones, while fighting Kakashi Sasuke did not understand Naruto's fixation with the clone technique, he assumed that it perhaps was something of a bond between swordsmen. Now that he knew of Naruto's apprenticeship Sasuke knew that Naruto valued their time together, and Sasuke was realizing that he was opening up more to the blonde in the week that they had been in wave than anyone else over the past couple of years. When Sasuke first realized that the blonde had wormed his way into cracking a part of the wall he had stubbornly built up, he had been shocked, but this feeling was instantaneously replaced by gratitude. Sasuke spent all his free time in Kanoha training in some aspect of the shinobi arts, and his lack of interaction with his peers outside of Team 7, most of whom he did not trust fully to let down his walls was severely limited. Naruto's training in Kenjutsu had always been away from the group, but Sasuke knew that the blonde was recognized to have enough potential for the complicated art, then he would have not only a friend in Naruto, perhaps, dare he say it, a rival as well. Yugao had long since left Naruto to train in his chakra control exercise, giving him all the pointers she saw fit, but leaving him with a vast majority of the thinking still to do. She noted he had made progress on the exercise and was fairly sure that he would have it mastered by the end of the day. 
as Naruto stumbled into the Tazuna household well past dinner time with a proud smile on his face, Yugao caught the boy before his face introduced itself to the wooden flooring of the house. He has trained himself to exhaustion just to finish the exercise, possibly because he could catch up to his peers. As she carried the boy to his futon and let him lay there until he recuperated, Yugao thought of her adventures with the boy and how tumultuous her life had been since that discreet encounter some four years ago. Yugao and Kakashi let Naruto have a lie in the following morning, after considering the state in which he had returned the previous night. Once he was well rested, he could join the rest of the Konoha Shinobi on the bridge they had suspected that Zabuza would have recovered sufficiently from his previous battle and could make another attempt on Tazuna's life soon, and therefore all hands were on deck, or in this situation, the bridge, for the protection of the client. As they headed to the bridge, Sakura thought about how Naruto had changed since she had last spied him on graduation day, looking desperately forlorn as he sulked away from the celebrating group. He had grown in her eyes, not physically, but he held a certain sharpness in his eyes, and that quality was quite often seen when he conducted himself as a ninja. When the group was on their downtime, he acted like the carefree person they had all grown to know when they were younger, but when it was time for his training, it was as though a switch was hit in the boy, making him all business. Naruto had been a true friend to her, Ino and the rest of their gang, but with their inevitable separation post-graduation, she had not been able to spend a lot of time with the blonde, and from her lack of awareness of his graduation, clearly not enough time to catch up on the events leading to his arrival in Wave. Between Sakura finishing the chakra control exercise first and heading off to guard duty on the bridge and Naruto's endless conversations with Sasuke at dinner, she had barely spoken to the boy and vowed to change that on their return journey. They had lots to catch up on, and Sakura did miss the times they spent together, even if it was in a ragtag group of clan heirs and social pariahs. Naruto felt very refreshed when he awoke the following morning. As the memories of his previous day played through his mind, he recalled how he had managed to drag himself to Tazuna's house and faintly recalled someone catching him before he fell face first onto the floor of the house. Stretching contentedly, Naruto realized that the other beds in the room were all empty and that the house was eerily quiet. Within seconds Naruto had realized he had been abandoned by Yugao and Team 7 and bolted down the stairs to where he spotted Tsunami working quietly in the kitchen. Ah. Naruto-kun, you are awake. Kakashi-sen said you might not be up till well past noon, Tsunami said with a smile on her face, unaware to the frustrations Naruto was feeling. I knew it. Naruto shouted, causing Tsunami to yelp in surprise. Naruto ran back upstairs to change his clothes and grab his sword so that he could join the other Konoha ninjas at the bridge. As Naruto left the house, he spied Inari and turned to face them. Can you believe they left me behind? Naruto shouted in the direction of Inari, who had not seen the blonde and was taken aback by the sheer shrillness of the boy's rant. Naruto hopped from one tree branch to the next as fast as he could to cover the time he had lost whilst in his slumber. He was so focused on cussing out his team for not involving him in their plan for the day that he nearly missed spotting a wild boar that was ruthlessly slashed up in the forest en route to the bridge. Stopping to inspect the damage, Naruto recognized the slashes had come from swords and saw that a series of slashes continued away from the boar and back in the direction that he had just come from. Damn it. Beto was unsure about the ambush on the bridge that he had Zabuza carry out. The ninja that had been hired for the wretched bridge builder, Tazuna's protection were quite capable, especially when led by the infamous Kakashi Haddock. The destruction of the bridge was paramount to Gato's continued success, as it would not only eliminate competition, but would also sap the morale of the people of the Land of Waves, which would make them more subservient. Furthermore, he had heard that the Konoha ninja had been reinforced with two other ninjas. Without looking up from his desk, Gato spoke in a quiet tone. Make sure the situation on the bridge goes smoothly. Kill Zabuza if needed, and his little minion too. In a shimmer, a ninja appeared dressed in a white and blue camouflage shirt and dark blue pants. The ninja bowed low as he accepted his mission, the sunlight that beamed through a solitary window in the office, reflecting off the scratched-out cloud high Tate wore on his left arm. Naruto rushed back to Tazuna's house as quickly as he could, adamant not to let anything happen to Tsunami and Inari. Naruto reached just in time to see Inari charging towards two samurai in an effort to save his mother unarmed and outnumbered. As the taller of the two samurai made his way to cut down the boy, Naruto intercepted his sword slash with a block from his own. The sudden block caught Waraji off guard and as a result was totally helpless to defend himself to the swift kick Naruto aimed towards the larger man's temple. As Naruto's heavy kick caught the man, he fell to the floor in a heap, causing Zori to turn in the direction of the clash, inadvertently allowing Tsunami to run away from her captors and towards her son. As Zori drew his sword upon seeing Naruto use his to beat him colleague, he sneered disdainfully at the seemingly inept ninja before him. As Naruto took his stance, Zori charged the blonde in an attempt to mow him down and salvaged this little side mission that Gato had assigned to the pair. 
Naruto dodged a vertical slash by Zori by skipping to his left and ducking under the subsequent sideways slash that followed up. Once inside Zori's guard, Naruto jumped up with his sword in a reverse grip and smashed at Zori's chin with the pommel of the sword, jarring the man's jaw and knocking him unconscious. After securing a length of rope from Inari, Naruto tied the two samurai for hire to ensure they would not cause any trouble. You were very brave Inari, a little stupid but very brave. I have to go save my friends now. Naruto said to the smaller boy, patting him on the head and bounding off through the forest towards the bridge. Sasuke was in a conundrum, and right now the conundrum had taken the shape of a loose dome made of ice mirrors. His masked opponent had stepped into one of the mirrors and immediately appeared on the faces of all the mirrors. He knew Kakashi and Yuga were fighting Zabuza together in hopes of getting a quick victory so as to settle this matter once and for all. He would have to fight his way out of this one by himself a prospect he was relishing. As Kakashi spotted the trouble Sasuke was in, he instructed Yugao to help the boy out of his predicament. Acknowledging the order, Yugao took off towards the mysterious dome but was required to step back a mere 10 meters from the ice dome in order to dodge a barrage of kunai that had been sent in her direction. Turning to face her hitherto unspotted attacker, Yugao gasped as she recognized the man whose arm was still outstretched. This had been the man that had ended her Anbu career and the man that led her on to the path of being Naruto's Jonin sensei. She had mixed feelings about the circumstances that followed after her previous battle with this ninja, but had no mixed feelings towards him. She loathed the man for what he had done to her arm. The pain of losing sensitivity in her left arm and the tormented time she had fighting off the infection that followed and the subsequent ejection from her Anbu duties ensured she had but one emotion to spare towards the man that faced her unadulterated anger. Mere seconds after Sasuke had been the sole focus of a multitude of near simultaneous attacks from various angles, he was no more relishing the prospect of pitting wit and skill against this opponent. He was faster than Sasuke was and unfortunately, the Achiha had not come up with a way of neutralizing the threat he posed with his Senban. Sasuke had picked up a plethora of bruises and scrapes minutes after the contest had started. In fact, he was so bruised that in comparison he made Naruto seem unblemished after a training session with Yugao. Chuckling to himself at the thought of thinking about the blonde in a situation like the one he was faced with allowed him to calm down a little and analyze the situation. I'm not being attacked by clones, that's for sure. These mirrors are somehow enhancing his speed to a level where it is impossible for me to follow, Sasuke thought to himself. Naruto spotted Sasuke trapped within the ice dome, unmoving but still on his feet. Unaware that Sasuke was just analyzing the situation in the brief respite he had been afforded, Naruto feared the worst and dashed into the ice dome to check up on his friend. As Naruto entered the dome and shook Sasuke, he snapped the boy out of his little reverie. What? Naruto. What are you doing here? Sasuke asked as he was shocked to find the boy within the ice dome. You're alive. Man I thought you were about to collapse. You were just standing there doing nothing. Geez, you had me scared there, Naruto replied, relief seeping into his voice once he realized that the raven-haired boy was not an incapacitated. As Sasuke was about to berate the boy for not thinking before charging in, he had to focus his attentions on dodging the senban that were let loose from the projections in the ice mirror. Dodge, Sasuke said, quickly alerting Naruto to the impending danger and trying to prevent his own hide from resembling that of a porcupine. Naruto remembered his lessons with Yugao and quickly pulled his sword out to assist in ensuring he did not become a human pincushion. Unfortunately for the blonde, the needles came at him from multiple sources and he was unable to block the vast majority of the senban from pricking his skin. As the masked ninja, Haku, was forced to split his attention between Naruto and Sasuke while focusing on controlling the vast amount of chakra required sustaining the demonic mirroring ice crystals technique, Sasuke noticed that the speed with which both he and Naruto were being attacked had dropped fractionally. As wave after wave of senbin were sent hurtling towards the boys, Sasuke was slowly able to discern the movements of his attacker. He had not realized that he had unlocked his Sharingan, allowing him to see the movements of his attacker better. Sasuke had assumed that it was Haku's fatigue that had led to the eventual slowing down of his attack speed, not the unlocking of the Ichiha Keke Genkai. However, Naruto had no such luck with avoiding the relentless attack. Having blocked the brunt of the attack with various parts of his body, Naruto had barely enough strength to hold his body up, falling onto one knee and panting heavily from the exertion of dodging all those damnable senbin. As soon as Yugao had spotted her attacker, she unsheathed her sword and charged at him. Recognizing the posture and stance that his attacker assumed, the former cloud ninja brought up his own sword to block the attack, intending to cleave his body in twain. As they interlocked blades and fought for dominance, the former cloud shinobi decided to introduce himself to his attacker. Akinoichi-san, we meet again. May I have the honor of learning your name this time? Scoffing at her attacker, Yugao pushed off her blade and created some separation between the two sword users. 
It's common courtesy to offer your own name before you ask for someone else's. Where are my manners? The cloud ninja said patronizingly. My name in King Kajiro. That attack of yours on my leg has severely hampered me you know. I fully intend to make you suffer the same pain. As the two ninja charged towards each other, they recommenced their deadly duel with the blades, intent on chopping the other's head off. As the blades entwined once again, Kin asked Yugao for her name once again. Head butting her opponent to give her a momentary advantage, Yugao followed up with a horizontal slash, which Kin had managed to dodge by leaning back in a show of flexibility that did nothing to lend credence to his age. Sweeping the legs from under the off-balanced man, Yugao knocked her opponent to the ground. Yugao Yuzuki, she said simply, intent on ending the life of the man in front of her. As she prepared for her decisive swing, she was forced to dodge a pair of shuriken headed straight for her face, providing Kin with sufficient time to get back on his feet and assume his stance. Bakashi was quite perplexed when Zabuza had nullified the principal advantage of the Sharingan. Fighting against a master of the art of the silent killing, in a mist so heavy that he could barely see two feet in front of him, was not conducive to his health. Sasuke had just jumped to save Naruto from being marked with a dozen senbin off his body. He could see Haku's movements clearly now and had intercepted the masked ninja with a solid kick to the face, but picked up a vast number of senbin for his troubles. As one of the senbin attacked a nerve cluster in his neck that would put him in an unconscious state for a while, he turned around to make sure Naruto was safe for the time being. That's the last time I can save your life now Naruto, Sasuke said, turning to face the blonde before falling to the floor. Naruto caught Sasuke before he could hit the floor and gently placed him on the bridge. Sasuke showed no signs of life as Naruto handled him. As Naruto lay his body over the pronicheha, he shook with raw emotion. Sasuke died saving me, and that mask idiot is going to pay for what he did. Unknowingly, Naruto leaked out an uncontrollable amount of the Kyuubi's chakra, healing his wounds at a tremendous rate and turning his fingers into claws. Charging towards the nearest mirror, Naruto drew his sword and slashed at the mirror. The force of the sword slash knocked the blade out of his hand as he spotted Haku switch from one mirror to the next. Dodging a brace of senbin sent towards him from Haku, Naruto grabbed Haku's leg as he passed by and shot a beam of chakra from his hand, without intending to cast the chakra beam jutsu, catching Haku flush in the face, shattering the mask that covered his face into innumerable pieces. As Naruto continued his attack, he was brought to a standstill when he noticed the face that was once behind the mask. This cannot be the face of a killer. What's happening? What's happening to me? As Naruto's anger was replaced by his confusion, the red chakra that had seeped out of him earlier began to recede back into his body. Why do you wait ninja-san? I just killed your friend. Seek your revenge, Haku said to Naruto, pieces of the mask piercing his once unblemished skin, causing rivulets of blood to streak down his face. As Naruto turned to face Sasuke, his anger boiled up once again, and he decided to channel that emotion into a single solid punch that caught Haku flush on the right cheek, knocking the boy off his feet and causing him to land with an echoing thud on the bridge. When the suffocating chakra had emitted from the direction of Naruto's and Sasuke's battle, Yugao had feared the worst. Surely the seal could not have broken. Unfortunately for her, Yugao had had her own battle to focus on, and despite the temporary distraction, Kin had once again gained his bearings and charged the former Anbu. Intent on ending her battle so that she could check up on Naruto, Yugao met her attacker's charge with a charge of her own. As the pair crossed swords in a flurry of attacks, Yugao managed to dodge a horizontal slash by ducking underneath it and whilst rising upwards, slashed her opponent from right hip to left shoulder. Kin fell to the bridge lifelessly as he sputtered blood from his mouth with his final breaths. The spike of the Kyuubi's chakra had ended as soon as it started. The volatile chakra had disappeared almost instantaneously, receding back into Naruto before Kin had even hit the floor. Bakashi was paranoid and rightfully so as he knew full well what kind of destructive ability that chakra had caused in the past. Intent on finishing his battle with Zabuza so that he could run damage control on the situation with Naruto, Kakashi summoned his dogs to help track down the elusive former seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. Without warning, Zabuza was trapped by a pack of dogs, firmly holding him in place he was completely helpless. Charging the chakra required for his patented assassination jutsu, Kakashi offered Zabuza a last chance to surrender before carrying out the execution. As Haku wearily got up from after being clobbered by Naruto, he recognized the imminent danger that Zabuza was in and quickly teleported towards his master. Kakashi charged forwards after Zabuza spat at his offer for surrender and thrust his arm forward. The lightning-encased forearm was moments away from ending Zabuza's life when, via the use of a teleportation jutsu, Haku appeared between the two and played the role of a human shield. As Kakashi's potent jutsu impaled the younger boy, Zabuza was able to escape the threat of death, at least momentarily. 
but the shock of finishing off the wrong target, Kakashi briefly realized that the flash of Kyuubi's chakra had dissipated and was no longer an issue that required immediate attention. Zabuza took the opportunity to counter against Kakashi in this brief moment of distraction, but was unable to land a decisive blow on his opponent. Kakashi quickly retaliated, incapacitating his opponent by rendering his arms useless. It's over Zabuza, give up, Kakashi said solemnly, turning to face the dead body of Haku. As the mist cleared up, Naruto was finally able to take stock of the situation. Yugao had won her battle against some ninja that he had not seen before. Her opponent lay dead in a pool of his own blood. Yugao noticed Naruto looking around and made her way towards the blonde. Naruto noticed Sakura and Ranmaru, who had been tasked with the protection of Tezuna, run towards the direction of Sasuke. As Sakura broke down into tears clutching the beaten Uchiha fiercely, Ranmaru offered the girl what little comfort he could. Beto arrived on the bridge to notice that Kin had been killed. It was a shame really, Kin had been an excellent ally over the past few years. But he wasn't irreplaceable. I'll just have to hire another tool. As he led a group of hired swords towards the fatigued ninja, Gato callously stepped on the arm of the now dead Haku. Yugao guided Naruto towards Kakashi as the three of them, along with Zabuza, faced the prospect of fighting off against Gato's men. It would have been an easy contest had it not been for the fatigue and the incapacitated demon of the mist. Kakashi, my fight with you is over. That bastard dared to defile Haku's memory. Toss me a kunai will you? Kakashi said nothing as he tossed the worn out Zabuza a spare kunai, which was caught in his mouth. Without pausing, Zabuza took off against the mob in front of him, tearing apart the amateur mercenaries with reckless abandon, reaching the cowering Gato at the end of the group and separating the smuggler's head from the rest of his body without a moment's hesitation. With the various swords he had accumulated in his back, Zabuza finally fell down to the floor. The demon of the mist had breathed his last breath, fighting to salvage the pride of his tool, defeating the oppressor of the land of waves. As Kakashi and Yuga looked on, Naruto was not able to bring himself to lay eyes on the scene that unfolded in front of him. Despite all his claims to the contrary, Zabuza had truly cared for Haku and his devil-may-care attitude towards his own life, as he mowed down the bulk of the attacking mob, illustrated the true extent of his feelings. Naruto, Yugao called, do not look away. You might have witnessed the death of a supposed madman, but he fought valiantly and with purpose until his last breath. Moreover, Zabuza was one of the greatest swordsmen ever to have lived. Pay your respects, kid. Yugao had great admiration for Zabuza's skills, and while she did not approve of his attempted coup d'etat, she was smart enough to recognize the man's skills. As Inari gathered the populace of Wave to put up a brave stance against the remnants of the mob, Kakashi boosted their numbers through the use of Kage Bunshin, causing the hired swords to quickly lose their bravado as they fled from the bridge. As Naruto turned back to face the crowd that Inari had gathered, he spotted Sasuke get up from the floor with the help of Ranmaru. Sakura shouted towards Kakashi and Naruto to tell them that Sasuke was all right, and Naruto breathed a huge sigh of relief. Sasuke was not dead after all, and that was always good news. Zabuza, Haku and Kin were given burials by the Kanohan in Zabuza and Haku next to each other, and Kin some ways off. After a couple of weeks, the building of the bridge was completed and Team 7's official mission had come to a close. After a teary goodbye, Kakashi led the ninjas towards Konoha, determined to get away from all the fighting of the past two weeks in order to get some well-deserved rest and relaxation. As they faded into the horizon, Tazuna had realized that they had yet to name the bridge after its completion. What do we call the bridge? Tazuna asked the crowd gathered behind him. From his place near his grandfather, Inari pulled on Tazuna's pant leg, forcing the older man to look down towards the younger boy. Looking up at his grandfather, Inari spoke three words that would be met with a chorus of approval. Bridge of hope, Inari said. As soon as they hit the border of the land of fire and the land of waves, the Kanoha ninja took to a more relaxed formation, seeing as to how they were not in hostile territory. The Kashi had recognized that Naruto was the son of his sensei and former Hokage the minute he had laid eyes on him. While he had not made contact with the boy until his brutal beat down near a bar in Kanoha, he had made moderate attempts to keep tabs on the boy. However, Kakashi seemed to have missed out on most of the malice that surrounded the boy. He wasn't completely at fault in this regard as whenever he had spotted Naruto in the past, the blonde wore a carefree smile and showed no adverse reaction to the hostile glares he received from those around him. The adoption of Naruto into the Nara family had finally leaked crucial information that was hidden from the vast majority of the population concerning the treatment he received. While the hostility and occasional verbal abuse that followed the boy was evident for all to see, how Kakashi had managed to miss out on the instances of physical abuse had had him hang his head in shame. It was only during that one instance behind that bar in Konoha that Kakashi was offered a true picture of the life of Naruto Uzumaki. Even in that instance, all he could offer Naruto was a glass of water and nothing more. 
Kakashi was more than willing and capable of apprehending Naruto's attacker and handing out his own brand of justice. However, the brutality of the attack had caught him unawares and had caused him to check up on the boy instead of pursuing the unknown attacker. Kakashi was glad that Yugao had forced her way into Naruto's life. He had heard all she had done for the boy from Yugao herself and was quite embarrassed at himself for not showing even a modicum of the initiative the purple-haired Kinoichi had undertaken. As Kakashi hopped amongst the trees, he noticed that the blonde that was currently occupying his thoughts had made an effort to catch up to him after spending the vast majority of their journey talking to the other genin. The hey oh Naruto-kun. What can I do for you? I just wanted to talk to you really. Ask you about some things about our time and wave. Kakashi said nothing as he motioned for Naruto to continue, gesturing with a wave of his hand. I know Yugao sensei and I were just a little bit late to provide any assistance to you and your team on your first encounter with Zabuza, but I noticed that he had used a bunshin technique which, according to Sasuke, was a solid clone made out of water, quite unlike the one we were taught in the academy. I was wondering if you could tell me more about the technique. Naruto asked. Kakashi idly wondered why Naruto chose to ask him the question and not his designated sensei, Yugao. Shrugging in indifference, Kakashi explained that Zabuza used a technique called the Mizubunshin, which allows the user to create a clone made out of water that possessed a tenth of the original power of the creator. Kakashi elaborated that similar clones could be made out of other elements as well, such as mud, rock and even wood, and that each clone had advantages and disadvantages as unique as the elements from which they were crafted. As Naruto digested the information Kakashi had bestowed upon him, he traveled in silence as he contemplated the information. The aspects of the clone techniques that Kakashi outlined were not the same as the Bunshin technique described in the Scroll of Seals. Naruto was slightly disappointed but had one more query on the subject matter before he gave up hope on the same. Kakashi sensei, when we faced off against the mob on the bridge, you created a whole bunch of clones to scare them off. What element were those clones made out of? That wasn't an elemental clone Naruto. That technique is called the Kage Bunshin and is actually marked as a Kenjutsu, Kakashi replied, quite happy to play the role of educator to the ever-inquisitive blonde. That's it. That's the one. I saw this technique in the Scroll of Seals when I was tricked by Mizuki-sensei, Naruto paused as the incident was brought up in his head and his face contorted in disgust at being duped so simply. Regaining his composure, Naruto continued, it is a Bunshin technique that splits the user's chakra in half, creating a very solid and very capable clone. Bakashi chuckled as he saw the whirlwind of emotions play on Naruto's face from excitement to anguish to neutral in a matter of seconds. You have good recall Naruto. Yes the Kage Bunshin technique allows you to split your chakra and it is precisely for this reason that it is a forbidden jutsu. If the user overextends himself trying to create too many clones, he could split his chakra so many times that the original would have too little chakra to sustain himself, leading to either chakra exhaustion or worse death. But you made so many clones when faced against the mob, and that was after your fight with Zabuza. Are you saying you could have died? Naruto asked, face morphing into a look of stupendous disbelief. Not exactly. I have formidable chakra control and quite a large reserve of chakra as well, though not as large as yours. Since we were fighting in a thick mist, Zabuza negated any benefits I would get from using the Sharingan, so I saved a lot of chakra by deactivating it. Naruto thought about what he had learned from Kakashi and decided to risk learning the technique anyway, or Atlas tried to. So can you teach me the technique Kakashi-sensei? Kakashi was caught unawares by Naruto's request. He had just outlined that using this technique could be detrimental to one's health, and yet the blonde had callously asked to be taught the very same technique. Before he could respond, Naruto continued. I know you said it's dangerous, but you also said that I have a larger chakra reserve than yours. Surely I can handle the technique even if my control isn't as good as yours. Naruto, you should know that there is also one more aspect of the technique that makes it quite dangerous to the user. The clones transfer all their memories back to their user once they have dispelled. Dispel a ton of clones simultaneously, and the mental backlash you might receive could be a shock to your brain. You might turn into a vegetable unable to function anymore. Surely it's not worth it. Kakashi said, trying to convince the boy to change his mind about learning the technique. If Naruto was able to recall the information from the scroll about the principles of the technique, there was a good chance that he learned the hand sign associated with it as well it was a fairly simple one after all. Memory transfer huh? Naruto thought to himself. So does that mean that if a clone read a book, I would know what it would learn once it is dispelled? Yes, that is the principle behind it, Kakashi replied. Kakashi decided to try another tactic instead after being unable to convince the boy to change his mind. Naruto, if you wanted to learn the technique so bad, why didn't you learn it the first time when you saw the technique outlined in the Scroll of Seals? The Bunshin Jutsu was what got me into my mess all those months ago. 
If I had to learn one technique before my allotted time, no way was I going to waste my time learning a technique I was doomed to fail. But after I saw you and Zabuza use your techniques in combat, learning a clone jutsu like that would be awesome. Can you imagine the damage I could do with that technique both in battle, Naruto paused as he rubbed his hands in glee, snickering at himself in pleasure, and outside of it. Bakashi paled at the prospect of Naruto using a forbidden jutsu to unload a veritable torrent of pranks on the unsuspecting populace of Konoha. Kakashi could not ascertain whether using Kage Bunshin to pull off pranks would be at the top of Naruto's priority list, but he knew for sure that things in Konoha would get a lot more interesting if the blonde did learn the technique. All of a sudden, Kakashi felt the urge to teach the boy the forbidden jutsu. There was a good chance that Naruto had remembered the hand sign required to execute the technique and only refrained from practicing it due to his aversion for the Bunshin variants prior to his mission in the Land of Waves. Moreover, it would be safer if the boy would learn the technique under supervision, lest he do irreparable damage to himself. After convincing himself, Kakashi decided to let Naruto know of his thoughts. Well I need to speak to you san first. She is your jonin sensei after all and therefore in charge of your training. Yada. Naruto exclaimed, so enthusiastic and excited about this latest development that he nearly missed the branch he had intended to skip off. Quickly regaining his footing, but not all of his pride as the rest of the group stared at his antics, Naruto continued on his merry way towards the large gates of Konoha. As soon as the members of Team 7 and Team Yugao checked in at the gates of Konoha, they were ushered towards the Hokage's office. Naruto was still ecstatic about the prospect of learning the Kage Bunshin technique after seeing the variants of the clone technique being put to good use in the mission to the Land of Waves. As they waited outside the office's double doors, Naruto went over to talk to the Hokage's secretary. Hello, Naruto-kun. You sure seem excited. I take it your C-rank mission to wave was successful. Makoto Yamanaka asked her fellow blonde. Hi. It was awesome. We met Zabuza, the demon of the mist, you know. Makoto looked shocked and turned to face the two jonin in charge for signs of confirmation. A slight nod from Yugao confirmed Naruto's story, but as she turned to face the blonde, she had realized that Naruto had continued rambling about the mission without pause. The beep of her telephone pried her away from listening to Naruto's storytelling as she held her index finger up to interrupt the blonde. After listening for a few short seconds, Mikoto turned towards Yugao and Kakashi and said told them they could bring their teams into the office for the debriefing. Tell me the rest of the story on your way out Naruto-kun, Mikoto called out to the blonde who seemed to be affronted by the interruption to his story narration. Turning around, with a quick thumbs up and a smile, to the aged secretary, Naruto walked past the burgundy double doors that led to the Hokage's office. And then Inari rounded up the majority of the wave populace, and together the numbers scared off the remaining hired swords, Kakashi finished his account of the mission, punctuated with additions from Yugao, Naruto and Sasuke where appropriate. Silence lingered in the Hokage's office for a long time, and the only sound in the office was the light shuffling of clothes and the crackle of the tobacco, as the Hokage lit his pipe with a low-level Katen Jutsu. As he exhaled the smoke out in a long and deliberate breath, Hiruzen finally addressed the gathering in front of him. So the demon of the mist is no more, huh? Who would have guessed his last act would be so noble, Hiruzen chuckled to himself. The Kanoha genin who witnessed the slaughter of the mob and Gato were hard-pressed to attach a sense of nobility to all the splattered blood, and while the Kakashi and Yugao understood the sentiments of their leader, they chose wisely to remain mute. Upon a lack of reaction from those in his office, Hiruzen decided to change the vein of the conversation. Congratulations Team 7 and Team Yugao on completing your first C-rank mission. As it was unofficially bumped into an A-rank mission, you shall be compensated appropriately, and the record shall be changed to show the same, here is unfinished. For the next week, you will be on the standby list. Think of it as a vacation, rest up and recharge your batteries, but you've had a taste of the real world now train and keep your skills sharp. Dismissed, here is unfinished. As the genin bowed before they left the room, Sasuke and Naruto noticed that Kakashi and Yugao had not made a move to follow them. Noticing their respective charges waiting for them at the door, the jonin signaled to them to leave and that they would be joined shortly. Sasuke nodded in acceptance of the silent order and dragged the more reluctant Naruto out through the double doors and into the hallway. Once the door behind him was shut, Naruto resigned himself to the fact that he was definitely not privy to the conversation on the other side of the door and walked towards Makoto Yamanaka and continued to regale her with the details of his latest adventure. Okage-sama, Yugao began, Naruto has asked to be taught the Kage Bunshin technique. I fear he noticed the technique when he was tricked by Mizuki to look into the scroll of seals. Hiruzen looked on quizzically, choosing to let Yugao continue with her explanation. I believe with his large chakra reserves and his aptitude towards the ninja arts, this would be a valuable asset, but as the Taju Kage Bunshin technique is a forbidden technique, I would like your approval on the matter, finished Yugao. 
Irizen said nothing as he turned towards Kakashi to hear what the copycat ninja had had to say about the matter. Kakashi thought briefly about what he wanted to say and then addressed his leader. He is quite fixated with the technique after having seen Zabuza using the Mizubunshin technique to good effect. Furthermore, I had used the Kage Bunshin in Wave as well, and he is adamant he learns the technique. Personally, I think he still remembers the hand seal for the technique, which would mean he would train in secret if we rejected the idea. Considering the effect the technique could have on the user, it would be safer if he was taught the Kage Bunshin technique under supervision, Kakashi said. Well looks like I really don't have a choice on the matter, do I? At least I know with the QB's reserves backing the boy up, the technique will be much less harmful to him than any other genin, here is inside before he took another puff on his pipe, nodding his assent before the two shinobi left him to his own devices. As Yugao stepped out of the office, she saw Naruto showing off his new sword to Mikoto, theatrically reenacting scenes of his fight against Zori and Wiraji. All right Naruto, it's time to go, Yugao said, pulling the blonde away from the bemused secretary by the scruff of his collar. As they exited the Hokage Tower, Team 7 split in different directions after being dismissed by Kakashi. Naruto heard Ranmaru mumble something about food as he walked towards his home, and Sakura ran away as fast as she could to get her well-deserved, and especially overdue, bath. All right Naruto, you gal will be in charge of your Kage Bunshin training. Just promise me you'll be careful when you learn the technique and when you use it. Remember what I told you about the memory recovery and use it well, Kakashi said, waving a lazy goodbye as he disappeared in a shunshin. Without even looking down to face Naruto, Yugao knew the blonde was ready to learn the technique right away. Not today, Naruto. Go home, rest, and relax. Go spend time with your family. I'll meet you in two days' time at our old training ground, okay? Naruto's face fell as he realized that he would not be learning the Kage Bunshin technique today, but lit up at the prospect of spending time with his family. He had not been doing much of the same since his graduation and figured he would make the best use of these next few days, spending quality time with Anaris. Smiling contentedly, Naruto bowed before he left, jogging down the path from the Hokage's office towards the Nara clan house. As Naruto approached the gates of the Nara clan compound, he heard the bellowing voice of Shikaku. Ah! The prodigal son returns. Shikaku said with a laugh. Naruto, I know as a ninja you are called away at a moment's notice, but I'd much rather hear it from you than the Hokage's messengers. Your mom and I have been worried sick for you. Naruto waited for Shikaku, while the elder of the two made strides towards the gates that blocked the Nara compound from the rest of Konoha. Naruto felt guilty for his sudden absence, and his guilt was further compounded by Shikaku's reference to himself and Yoshino as Naruto's parents. Naruto was absolutely delighted to be adopted by the Naras, but a year had passed, and Naruto still referred to them both by their names and not as mother and father. It was a little disconcerting to Naruto to call them such when he knew nothing of his own biological parents. To their credit, neither Shikaku nor Yoshino pressurized the boy into the address, but they did feel very protective about the boy, and Naruto could not justify to himself that he reciprocated their affection in kind. He would make it up to them and the next few days provided the perfect opportunity. As Naruto and Shikaku approached the house, they spotted Shikamaru sitting on the porch of the house, looking blankly at an open shogi board. Shikaku looked from Shikamaru to Naruto and spoke in a voice loud enough so that his voice just carried over to the bored-looking boy, and here Naruto, we have your antithesis, the laziest boy in all of Konoha, I introduce you to Shikamaru Nara. Naruto laughed at the younger Nara's expense, as Shikamaru shot a sour look towards the Nara clan head. Shikaku could not resist joining in with this adopted son as they finally reached the threshold of the house. Shikaku sat down on the other side of the open board while he ushered Naruto into the house to meet Yoshino. Shikamaru finally smiled as he set up the pieces on his side of the board and offered to do the same for his father, who chose to set up his own. As it was nearing lunchtime, Yoshino was preparing the meal in the kitchen and was just dicing up some vegetables when she heard Naruto. Yoshino-san, I am back. I am sorry I didn't have time to tell you I was leaving, it was an emergency, Naruto said coyly, scratching the back of his neck with his right hand and offering a sheepish smile in hopes of placating any lingering anger he might have caused. Don't worry about it Naruto-kun. I know what the life of a ninja is like. Having said that, I would like to know a bit about what's going on. It seems that yugao san has claimed a monopoly on your time since even before you became genin, Yoshino told the blonde, feigning anger at the last part of her statement, by bringing up her rolling pin and making a threatening gesture, smile firmly upon her face nonetheless. Naruto gulped involuntarily but quickly realized that Yoshino meant no harm and so he offered to help out in the kitchen while the two of them caught up on recent events. When most of the preparations for the meal were done, Naruto excused himself to join the men of the house. 
Naruto went to his room, changed his clothes and deposited his sword near his bed, and went to see what Shikamaru and Shikaku were doing with a strange-looking board. So Shikamaru, how come you are at home? Don't you have any missions or training to do? Naruto asked the younger of the two Naras. Asuma sensei was requested for a mission by the fire daimyo, and so he is off for a few days. We have the time to rest and train. That's great, I have a couple of days off as well, we should train together, said Naruto enthusiastically until he spotted the non-committal roll of the lazy Nara's eyes. Shikaku laughed as he moved a piece on the board to another spot, causing Shikamaru to cringe inwardly. It's a good idea. The two of you should train together. By the way Naruto, did you get a sword from Yuga-san? I could have sworn I saw you wear one on your way in. Shikamaru had noticed the scabbard and sword combination as well, and was curious about this latest development. Naruto recounted the events at Wave to the two Nara men, and described his training with Yugao after their encounter with Zabuza and Haku. After he finished his story, Naruto looked up to see Shikamaru's jaw halfway down to the floor of the porch, and Shikaku's eyes nearly bugging out of his sockets. Zabuza? You mean the demon of the mist? He died. Saving you? Shikaku sounded stupendous. Well I don't think it was his intention, but because of him, we didn't have to fight Gato's thugs, so I guess he did save us. Shikaku was still spellbound, the demon of the mist had died, and his last act had, intentionally or not, saved his adopted son. The image of the bloodthirsty warrior and the account of from his son were totally contrasting each other, and he wondered how the man went from beast to savior. Did you tell your mother? Shikaku asked, unable to come up with any good follow-up question pertinent to the mission. Naruto shook his head. I didn't want to get her concerned with what happened. So I skipped most of the gory details. Shikaku laughed boisterously as he said, don't worry Naruto. She has seen me return from missions in various states and knows how to handle being part of a shinobi family. I am sure she appreciates your concern, but feel free to tell her whatever is not classified information. She can more than handle herself. Naruto nodded and sat silently as he watched the two men continue their game until they were all summoned to lunch. The two Naras left their game undisturbed on the porch and decided to come back to it after the midday meal. Shikamaru, could you teach me that game you were playing? Shikamaru turned towards the blonde and smiled. Sure. He would have a new opponent to match wits against sure Naruto wasn't the sharpest opponent he would have, that honor belonged to his father, but Naruto was known to be unpredictable, and that would make his games fun at the very least. As they sat for lunch, Naruto decided to tell Yoshino all the details of his mission, which elicited appropriately timed shock gasps from the only female in the house, as Naruto detailed the specifics of the Konoha ninja's encounter with the recently deceased demon of the mist. In an effort to offer comfort to her adopted son, Yoshino piled on more food onto Naruto's plate, a form of comfort offering she had subconsciously attained from all her experiences with the Akimichi family. After recounting the events of his mission, Naruto listened to Shikamaru as the Nara explained the basic rules of the game to the blonde so that he could follow the game between the two Naras when it recommenced after their break for lunch. Naruto scratched his head as he watched the two Naras duke it out over the shogi board. Shikaku tried his best to explain the function of each of the pieces without giving away his strategy. Shikamaru had yet to best his father at a game of shogi, but Shikaku knew that the boy was getting ever closer to changing that statistic. With every move Shikaku made, Naruto tried to understand its true purpose, but failed to do so on more than the majority of the occasions. However, he noticed that he was not the only one exasperated by the clan head strategy, as Shikamaru was concentrating as best as he could, perspiring in the effort, accentuated by the midday heat. Within three short moves, Shikaku had Shikamaru cornered, and the younger boy was forced to concede defeat yet again. That was much closer than all our other games Shika. Well played. Frustrated at not being able to best his father again, he crumpled in a heap on the porch, laying on his back, whilst he watched the clouds. However, as Shikaku began explaining his strategy to Naruto, Shikamaru perked up and began paying attention to their conversation without changing his expression or posture. Over the next two days, Naruto played several games of shogi with Shikamaru and was beaten in every single one of them with a ruthless efficiency. If Shikamaru was as stealthy and sneaky in combat as he was with his shogi, Naruto had no doubt he would make an excellent assassin. All would seem fine until Shikamaru would move a single piece, which would ensnare the blonde in a web of strategy and cunning. At the end of the first day, Shikamaru had given Naruto a beginner's book into shogi strategy. However, even after applying everything he had learned about strategy, Naruto was helpless to Shikamaru's ploys. Taking a leaf out of his father's book, Shikamaru decided to offer the boy some well-deserved praise. You have picked up the game really well Naruto. Not a lot of people understand the game so well so quickly, Shikamaru offered in compliment as he stepped back into the house. Naruto perked up at hearing the praise from his adopted brother. But you are still 50 years away from beating me at this game. 
Naruto's smile faded as he picked up a random piece and flung it with unerring accuracy at the back of Shikamaru's head. As the Nara turned to face his attacker, Naruto stuck his tongue out at the boy and bolted towards the wooded area that surrounded much of the clan compound. He had had his revenge, now it was time to train. Naruto arrived at a clearing he used for training whilst in the clan compound and began molding chakra in his right hand. A faint whisper of blue chakra accumulated in his hands for several seconds before it dissipated into the winds. Growling to himself, Naruto sat down on the forest floor and tried to remember what he had read about the technique in the scroll of seals. The first part of the technique was to gather chakra in the palm of the one's hand and use it to levitate a leaf over a period of time at a fixed distance away from the palm. Naruto's control had vastly improved since their training exercises in the land of waves, however, he was unable to sustain the technique for a sufficient amount of time. Naruto was able to vaguely recall using the technique on Mizuki and Haku, but could not draw upon the specifics to help him recreate the effect. Sighing, Naruto practiced his tree walking for a while longer, in hopes that it would help with his training for the chakra beam technique. After completing several runs from top to bottom, Naruto stopped training his control and reverted back to improving the chakra beam. Naruto placed a leaf on his palm and began gathering chakra watching as the leaf rose a few inches and hovered at the predetermined distance for a while. It was progress, but Naruto could not judge if it was sufficient progress. Deciding that he would need to use the technique from both his palms, Naruto began training in the first part of the technique with his left hand. Naruto had realized very early that if he was to become a swordsman, a technique such as the chakra beam would be ill-suited to him if he was only able to use the technique with his sword hand. This would mean that Naruto would have to drop his sword in order to use the technique, and so the blonde decided to learn it with both hands so that it afforded him versatility. As the light began to fade, Naruto decided to head home and freshen up before dinner. He would start training with Yugao in earnest tomorrow, and there was no point if he wore himself out the night before. After a quick breakfast, Naruto had gone to training ground 4 to meet Yugao. As he had arrived a little earlier than the planned 8 o'clock start time, he decided to limber up by doing some light exercises. Yugao arrived in a shunshin just as Naruto was about to finish up his exercises and waited until he did. She knew his routine, it would only take a few moments. Deciding to make her presence known, Yugao Shunshine from her spot in the tree into the clearing that was their designated meeting place. All right Naruto, the Hokage has approved you learning the Kage Bunshin Jutsu, but I need to make you aware of the risks of the technique before I can teach you how to do. The technique creates clones that are actual copies of your body, which means they have a physical presence. Furthermore, the technique divides the amount of chakra the user uses evenly into the clones that were created. I am sure I don't need to tell you what might happen if you were to create more clones than you can handle, Yugao said solemnly, letting the word sink in before she continued with the appropriate hand signs for the technique. The Kage Bunshin, like Kakashi-san told you, can be used to multiply your training time. Since you gain all the experience of the dispelled clones, this technique is very useful in learning a lot of things in a lot less time. Having said that, the mental backlash of dispelling several clones simultaneously and assimilating all that information will be severe, so once again, make sure you know how much stress you can handle," Yuga continued, watching Naruto as he nodded at all the right times to show that he understood the risks of the technique. Yuga wasn't completely convinced with his response, but decided to move on regardless. Naruto waited patiently, he had remembered all the details about the Tajukage Bunshin technique from the Scroll of Seals, and realized that since the whole process required permission from the Hokage, such matters needed to be addressed. Nonetheless, the blonde was getting jumpy and began to slightly rock back and forth on his heels in anticipation. Watching the swing boy, Yugao decided it was enough of the talk and time to get into the action. Showing Naruto the simple hand seal required for the technique, she created a clone herself to demonstrate how useful it could be. Unlike the Bunshin Jutsu, this body is real, which means it can do physical damage, and since it has its own chakra, it can cast Jutsu as well, Yugao finished as the clone unleashed a low-level Katen Jutsu away from the group. After a few hours, Naruto had managed to successfully complete the technique. Under Yugao's watchful eye and bountiful advice, Naruto had managed to split his chakra effectively enough to make a suitable shadow clone. Let me show you something, Yugao said as she made another clone, her previous one having dispelled ages ago. As Yugao's shadow clone led Naruto's own away from their originals, Yugao continued. Remember what I told you about learning from your clones? She asked. Unaware of what was really happening, Naruto just nodded dumbly, trying to figure out what the point of taking the clone away was. With a sudden influx of information, Naruto proceeded to obey a silent command and ducked his head to the ground. Just as he made the motion, Yugao swung her right arm in a chopping motion parallel to the ground in an attempt to swipe at Naruto's head. Very good. 
the purple-haired Kinoichi said, genuinely impressed at the speed with which Naruto was able to process the information and act upon it. Sure she could have struck him without giving him the amount of time she did, but it was his first attempt at the memory assimilation from a dispelled Kage Bunshin, it was only fair. Naruto rose from his crouched position in the ground and faced his teacher, his jaw hanging loosely from the disbelief that his teacher would to attempt attack him. What are you doing? You were going straight for my temple. You could have knocked me out. Said the blonde, aghast at the execution of this teaching method. Yugao merely offered a shrug. Train in the technique. Focus on channeling the right amount of chakra you need to make a set number of clones. Make a pair, then five, then seven and ten. When you can do that we will continue with your kinjutsu training, Yugao said, deciding to stand in the shade of the trees as the sun shone brighter. Naruto strained to focus on channeling the right amount of chakra for the technique. This was much harder than creating a single clone. Focusing on creating the clones was especially different when the sensation of splitting your chakra was so alien. Nonetheless, once he was accustomed to the feeling, it wasn't quite as uncomfortable, and Naruto was able to meet Yugao's target in just over an hour. Before he could dispel the ten clones he had so painstakingly created, Yugao appeared out of air in front of him. Don't get rid of them just yet. Why don't you make them do the chakra training exercises you learnt in Wave? We can grab some lunch before we start, Yugao said. So everything the clones learn, I learn when they are dispelled right? Naruto asked, clogs turning in his head as he wondered about the true potential of this feature of the technique. Yugao just nodded in response and began to walk away from the clearing and towards the shade, where a shadow clone she had created had brought and kept some packed lunches for the pair of them. Naruto thought to himself as he turned to face his clones. Okay, split up into two groups. One of you do the tree climbing exercise that Yugao sensei asked us to do, and the rest of you work on doing the chakra beam. Work on adding some power into the technique for the right hand and some control for the left. Thanks guys. Naruto shouted the last bit over his back as he jogged up to join Yugao for lunch. Lunch was a simple affair consisting of the bento box that Yugao's clone had prepared for the two of them. It was only when Naruto finally sat down on the grass did he realize how tired he was. Collapsing to the ground in an undignified heap, Naruto ate his share of the food in the box, after an eager exclamation of Ida Akamasu. Yugao let Naruto rest up for a while longer after all the food was consumed. It wasn't needed in any case, since Naruto showed remarkable rates of recovery amongst shinobi. Yugao would be hard-pressed to match Naruto's progress with the Kage Bunshin Jutsu, but in her defense, she did not possess a massive chakra battery, in the form of the Kayubi nestled in under her navel. Alright then, let's go check up on your clones and see what they've managed to get up to, Yugao said as she got up, dusting the seat of her trousers to rid of all the grass that might have clung on during their lunch break. As they re-entered the clearing, Yugao was surprised to see a group of Naruto clones near sprinting the height of the trees, dodging branches with ease as they reached their respective tree's zenith. You can dispel your clones now Naruto. I see you have pretty much mastered the tree climbing exercise. Remind me to teach you the next phase of the chakra control exercises when we have some time. As Naruto dispelled the ten clones, he received a huge amount of information, as well as replenished some of his chakra. Alright. Come on then. Know that you know the Kage Bunshin technique, I can teach you the forms required for the dance of the crescent moon, Yugao said. The rest of the day involved Naruto using his shadow clones to learn the advanced kinjutsu form. Yugao decided to teach Naruto the form by making him experience it firsthand. By the end of the day, Yugao had gone through a veritable army of susceptible Naruto clones, slashing the clones in spectacular fashion. Yugao told Naruto that the point of this method was to learn the approach of the technique and the principles behind this form. It was quite a difficult thing to master at such a young age, but Yugao had felt Naruto had the aptitude to understand the basics and build up the technique as suited him best. Naruto left the training ground feeling absolutely mortified he had been slashed up so many times by Yugao that he felt a little queasy. Every time Naruto would be executed Yugao would come up to him and ask him questions about the form what he learned, what was different from the previous attack, and what he would do to change things. It was a refreshing change of pace, but that did not mean he was completely at ease with watching a copy of himself get chopped up mercilessly. Naruto was beginning to question Yugao's sensitivity and sanity, this was the same woman who went out of her way to protect him and instruct him. However, when Yugao had a sword in her hand, Naruto could have sworn she was no longer the caring teacher he once had she was the stone-cold killer that was once a part of Anbu. The next day, Naruto entered the clearing at training ground 4 to see two Yugaos waiting for him. Confused, Naruto made his way to the pair of them while they continued talking. Alright Naruto. Since you've mastered the tree climbing exercise, my clone will teach your clones the next phase of the chakra control program. Make about ten clones and ask them to follow my own, said the Yugao on the right of Naruto, indicating herself to be the creator and not the copy. 
doing as instructed, Naruto created the ten clones, and the near dozen copies wordlessly followed the Yuga clone away from the clearing. So, what exactly is the next phase of the chakra control program? Naruto asked, curious as to what his clones were going to be subject to. Water walking. Unlike with the tree climbing exercise, you need to constantly shift your chakra to match your body's need to sustain itself on the surface of the water, fail to do so, and you'll sink below, replied Yugao. Nodding in understanding, Naruto waited as he watched Yugao pull a pair of ankle weights out of the rucksack she had tossed on the clearing floor before Naruto had arrived. Naruto's dreaded speed training session had begun, it was critical that he increased his speed so that he could execute the dance of the crescent moon with perfection. Yugao had explained that the technique utilized the Kage Bunshin to attack the opponent from multiple angles, and if the speed of the user was not up to par, a skillful opponent could counter the attack. While Naruto had yet to learn the technique in earnest, for he had only seen Yugao use it, she explained that if the basics of the technique were not mastered, then the technique would be rendered useless, there was a reason it was marked an air and kinjutsu technique after all. Over the next few days, Naruto trained almost exclusively with his speed under the hawk-like gaze of Yugao. She pointed out aspects of his running style that could be improved and how he should alter his style when approaching an enemy with his sword in hand. Naruto only trained in the basic kinjutsu since the break Team 7 and Team Yugao had been afforded since the mission to the Land of Waves. Yugao had certainly noticed the improvement in Naruto's use of the sword and was quite pleased with herself for nurturing such a talent. At the end of every day, Yugao would ask Naruto to dispel the clones he had created earlier in the day and try the water walking exercise for himself. Having accumulated the memories of his clones, Naruto wisely chose to strip down to his bare essentials, lest he had to return home, drenched in water. All right Naruto. Let's see what your clones have learned from mine, Yugao instructed Naruto. Naruto had learned the technique within two days with the help of his clone, and Yugao was pleased with his performance. As Naruto balanced himself on the water shakily he looked up to his sensei with a proud smile on his face. Yugao sensei I got it. I can water walk now, said Naruto, trying to take a few shaky experimental steps to prove his point. Just as he turned to face Yugao once again, he saw her throw a kunai at his direction. The projectile was slow moving but headed directly for Naruto's left shoulder. Panicking, Naruto turned hastily in an attempt to dodge the thrown dagger, but instantaneously lost his footing on the surface of the water, falling in the waist-deep water of the stream they had been practicing in. Dragging himself onto the bank of the river, Naruto coughed out the water he had unintentionally swallowed. As he regained his composure, Naruto pointed an accusatory finger at his teacher. What are you doing? Naruto shouted, waving his finger around as if to emphasize his displeasure you could have seriously hurt me there. Water walking isn't a technique you can use to knock out an opponent, it's an accessory for a ninja. If you cannot maintain your balance after a single attack, you can't win a battle on water. To truly master water walking, you need to be able to move on water as subconsciously as you would on land. Remember that because the next part of your water walking training will be done by yourself, with your own clones, aiming to knock you down with your own kunai. Said Yugao, driving home the point to the blonde that his training was never well and truly finished. Naruto attempted to sputter a response, but quickly conceded the point. If he was up against Abusa and a battle on water, he was sure that the demon of the mist would spare him no quarter. That's it for today. You have the day off tomorrow so rest up. We will see if we can get a mission soon, Yugao told the blonde, causing him to light up at the prospect of another mission. As soon as the members of Team 7 and Team Yugao checked in at the gates of Konoha, they were ushered towards the Hokage's office. Naruto was still ecstatic about the prospect of learning the Kage Bunshin technique after seeing the variants of the clone technique being put to good use in the mission to the Land of Waves. As they waited outside the office's double doors, Naruto went over to talk to the Hokage's secretary. Hello, Naruto-kun. You sure seem excited. I take it your C-rank mission to Wave was successful. Makoto Yamanaka asked her fellow blonde. Hi. It was awesome. We met Zabuza, the demon of the mist, you know. Makoto looked shocked and turned to face the two jonin in charge for signs of confirmation. A slight nod from Yugao confirmed Naruto's story, but as she turned to face the blonde, she had realized that Naruto had continued rambling about the mission without pause. A beep of her telephone pried her away from listening to Naruto's storytelling as she held her index finger up to interrupt the blonde. After listening for a few short seconds, Makoto turned towards Yugao and Kakashi and said told them they could bring their teams into the office for the debriefing. Tell me the rest of the story on your way out Naruto-kun, Makoto called out to the blonde who seemed to be affronted by the interruption to his story narration. Turning around, with a quick thumbs up and a smile, to the aged secretary, Naruto walked past the burgundy double doors that led to the Hokage's office. 
and then Inari rounded up the majority of the wave populace, and together the numbers scared off the remaining hired swords, Kakashi finished his account of the mission, punctuated with additions from Yugao, Naruto and Sasuke where appropriate. Silence lingered in the Hokage's office for a long time, and the only sound in the office was the light shuffling of clothes and the crackle of the tobacco, as the Hokage lit his pipe with a low-level Katen Jutsu. As he exhaled the smoke out in a long and deliberate breath, Hiruzen finally addressed the gathering in front of him. So the demon of the mist is no more, huh? Who would have guessed his last act would be so noble, Hiruzen chuckled to himself. The Kanoha genin who witnessed the slaughter of the mob and Gato were hard-pressed to attach a sense of nobility to all the splattered blood, and while the Kakashi and Yugao understood the sentiments of their leader, they chose wisely to remain mute. Upon the lack of reaction from those in his office, Hiruzen decided to change the vein of the conversation. Congratulations Team 7 and Team Yugao on completing your first C-rank mission. As it was unofficially bumped into an A-rank mission, you shall be compensated appropriately, and the record shall be changed to show the same, Hiruzen finished. For the next week, you will be on the standby list. Think of it as a vacation, rest up and recharge your batteries, but you've had a taste of the real world now train and keep your skills sharp. Dismissed, Hiruzen finished. As the genin bowed before they left the room, Sasuke and Naruto noticed that Kakashi and Yugao had not made a move to follow them. Noticing their respective charges waiting for them at the door, the jonin signaled to them to leave and that they would be joined shortly. Sasuke nodded in acceptance of the silent order and dragged the more reluctant Naruto out through the double doors and into the hallway. Once the door behind him was shut, Naruto resigned himself to the fact that he was definitely not privy to the conversation on the other side of the door and walked towards Makoto Yamanaka and continued to regale her with the details of his latest adventure. Okage-sama, Yugao began, Naruto has asked to be taught the Kage Bunshin technique. I fear he noticed the technique when he was tricked by Mizuki to look into the scroll of seals. Hiruzen looked on quizzically, choosing to let Yugao continue with her explanation. I believe with his large chakra reserves and his aptitude towards the ninja arts, this would be a valuable asset, but as the Tajukage Bunshin technique is a forbidden technique, I would like your approval on the matter, finished Yugao. Hiruzen said nothing as he turned towards Kakashi to hear what the copycat ninja had had to say about the matter. Kakashi thought briefly about what he wanted to say and then addressed his leader. He is quiet fixated with the technique after having seen Zabuza using the Mizubunshin technique to good effect. Furthermore, I had used the Kage Bunshin in Wave as well, and he is adamant he learns the technique. Personally, I think he still remembers the hand seal for the technique, which would mean he would train in secret if we rejected the idea. Considering the effect the technique could have on the user, it would be safer if he was taught the Kage Bunshin technique under supervision, Kakashi said. Well looks like I really don't have a choice on the matter, do I? At least I know with the QB's reserves backing the boy up, the technique will be much less harmful to him than any other genin, here is inside before he took another puff on his pipe, nodding his assent before the two shinobi left him to his own devices. As Yugao stepped out of the office, she saw Naruto showing off his new sword to Makoto, theatrically reenacting scenes of his fight against Zori and Wiraji. All right Naruto, it's time to go, Yugao said, pulling the blonde away from the bemused secretary by the scruff of his collar. As they exited the Hokage Tower, Team 7 split in different directions after being dismissed by Kakashi. Naruto heard Ranmaru mumble something about food as he walked towards his home, and Sakura ran away as fast as she could to get her well-deserved and especially overdue bath. All right Naruto, Yuga will be in charge of your Kage Bunshin training. Just promise me you'll be careful when you learn the technique and when you use it. Remember what I told you about the memory recovery and use it well, Kakashi said, waving a lazy goodbye as he disappeared in a shunshin. Without even looking down to face Naruto, Yugao knew the blonde was ready to learn the technique right away. Not today, Naruto. Go home, rest, and relax. Go spend time with your family. I'll meet you in two days' time at our old training ground, okay? Naruto's face fell as he realized that he would not be learning the Kage Bunshin technique today, but lit up at the prospect of spending time with his family. He had not been doing much of the same since his graduation and figured he would make the best use of these next few days, spending quality time with Anaris. Smiling contentedly, Naruto bowed before he left, jogging down the path from the Hokage's office towards the Nara clan house. As Naruto approached the gates of the Nara clan compound, he heard the bellowing voice of Shikaku. Ah! The prodigal son returns. Shikaku said with a laugh. Naruto, I know as a ninja you are called away at a moment's notice, but I'd much rather hear it from you than the Hokage's messengers. Your mom and I have been worried sick for you. Naruto waited for Shikaku, while the elder of the two made strides towards the gates that blocked the Nara compound from the rest of Konoha. Naruto felt guilty for his sudden absence, and his guilt was further compounded by Shikaku's reference to himself and Yoshino as Naruto's parents. 
Naruto was absolutely delighted to be adopted by the Naras, but a year had passed, and Naruto still referred to them both by their names and not as mother and father. It was a little disconcerting to Naruto to call them such when he knew nothing of his own biological parents. To their credit, neither Shikaku nor Yoshino pressurized the boy into the address, but they did feel very protective about the boy, and Naruto could not justify to himself that he reciprocated their affection in kind. He would make it up to them and the next few days provided the perfect opportunity. As Naruto and Shikaku approached the house, they spotted Shikamaru sitting on the porch of the house, looking blankly at an open shogi board. Shikaku looked from Shikamaru to Naruto and spoke in a voice loud enough so that his voice just carried over to the bored looking boy, and here Naruto, we have your antithesis, the laziest boy in all of Konoha, I introduce you to Shikamaru Nara. Naruto laughed at the younger Nara's expense as Shikamaru shot a sour look towards the Nara clan head. Shikaku could not resist joining in with this adopted son as they finally reached the threshold of the house. Shikaku sat down on the other side of the open board while he ushered Naruto into the house to meet Yoshino. Shikamaru finally smiled as he set up the pieces on his side of the board and offered to do the same for his father, who chose to set up his own. As it was nearing lunchtime, Yoshino was preparing the meal in the kitchen and was just dicing up some vegetables when she heard Naruto. Yoshino-san, I am back. I am sorry I didn't have time to tell you I was leaving, it was an emergency, Naruto said coyly, scratching the back of his neck with his right hand and offering a sheepish smile in hopes of placating any lingering anger he might have caused. Don't worry about it Naruto-kun. I know what the life of a ninja is like. Having said that, I would like to know a bit about what's going on. It seems that Yugao san has claimed a monopoly on your time since even before you became genin, Yoshino told the blonde, feigning anger at the last part of her statement by bringing up her rolling pin and making a threatening gesture, smile firmly upon her face nonetheless. Naruto gulped involuntarily but quickly realized that Yoshino meant no harm and so he offered to help out in the kitchen while the two of them caught up on recent events. When most of the preparations for the meal were done, Naruto excused himself to join the men of the house. Naruto went to his room, changed his clothes and deposited his sword near his bed and went to see what Shikamaru and Shikaku were doing with the strange-looking board. So Shikamaru, how come you are at home? Don't you have any missions or training to do? Naruto asked the younger of the two Naras. Asuma-sensei was requested for a mission by the fire daimyo and so he is off for a few days. We have the time to rest and train. That's great, I have a couple of days off as well, we should train together, said Naruto enthusiastically until he spotted the non-committal roll of the lazy Nara's eyes. Shikaku laughed as he moved a piece on the board to another spot, causing Shikamaru to cringe inwardly. It's a good idea. The two of you should train together. By the way Naruto, did you get a sword from Yuga-san? I could have sworn I saw you wear one on your way in. Shikamaru had noticed the scabbard and sword combination as well and was curious about this latest development. Naruto recounted the events at Wave to the two Nara men and described his training with Yugao after their encounter with Zabuza and Haku. After he finished his story, Naruto looked up to see Shikamaru's jaw halfway down to the floor of the porch and Shikaku's eyes nearly bugging out of his sockets. Zabuza. You mean the demon of the mist. He died. Saving you? Shikaku sounded stupendous. Well I don't think it was his intention, but because of him, we didn't have to fight Gato's thugs, so I guess he did save us. Shikaku was still spellbound, the demon of the mist had died, and his last act had, intentionally or not, saved his adopted son. The image of the bloodthirsty warrior and the account of from his son were totally contrasting each other, and he wondered how the man went from beast to savior. Did you tell your mother? Shikaku asked, unable to come up with any good follow-up question pertinent to the mission. Naruto shook his head. I didn't want to get her concerned with what happened. So I skipped most of the gory details. Shikaku laughed boisterously as he said, don't worry Naruto. She has seen me return from missions in various states and knows how to handle being part of a shinobi family. I am sure she appreciates your concern, but feel free to tell her whatever is not classified information. She can more than handle herself. Naruto nodded and sat silently as he watched the two men continue their game until they were all summoned to lunch. The two Naras left their game undisturbed on the porch and decided to come back to it after the midday meal. Shikamaru, could you teach me that game you were playing? Shikamaru turned towards the blonde and smiled. Sure. He would have a new opponent to match wits against sure Naruto wasn't the sharpest opponent he would have, that honor belonged to his father, but Naruto was known to be unpredictable, and that would make his games fun at the very least. As they sat for lunch, Naruto decided to tell Yoshino all the details of his mission, which elicited appropriately timed shock gasps from the only female in the house, as Naruto detailed the specifics of the Kanoha ninja's encounter with the recently deceased demon of the mist. 
In an effort to offer comfort to her adopted son, Yoshino piled on more food onto Naruto's plate, a form of comfort offering she had subconsciously attained from all her experiences with the Akamichi family. After recounting the events of his mission, Naruto listened to Shikamaru as the Nara explained the basic rules of the game to the blonde so that he could follow the game between the two Naras when it recommenced after their break for lunch. Naruto scratched his head as he watched the two Naras duke it out over the shogi board. Shikaku tried his best to explain the function of each of the pieces without giving away his strategy. Shikamaru had yet to best his father at a game of shogi, but Shikaku knew that the boy was getting ever closer to changing that statistic. With every move Shikaku made, Naruto tried to understand its true purpose but failed to do so on more than the majority of the occasions. However, he noticed that he was not the only one exasperated by the clan head strategy as Shikamaru was concentrating as best as he could, perspiring in the effort, accentuated by the midday heat. Within three short moves, Shikaku had Shikamaru cornered and the younger boy was forced to concede defeat yet again. That was much closer than all our other games Shika. Well played. Frustrated at not being able to best his father again, he crumpled in a heap on the porch, laying on his back whilst he watched the clouds. However, as Shikaku began explaining his strategy to Naruto, Shikamaru perked up and began paying attention to their conversation without changing his expression or posture. Over the next two days, Naruto played several games of shogi with Shikamaru and was beaten in every single one of them with a ruthless efficiency. If Shikamaru was as stealthy and sneaky in combat as he was with his shogi, Naruto had no doubt he would make an excellent assassin. All would seem fine until Shikamaru would move a single piece, which would ensnare the blonde in a web of strategy and cunning. At the end of the first day, Shikamaru had given Naruto a beginner's book into shogi strategy. However, even after applying everything he had learned about strategy, Naruto was helpless to Shikamaru's ploys. Taking a leaf out of his father's book, Shikamaru decided to offer the boy some well-deserved praise. You have picked up the game really well Naruto. Not a lot of people understand the game so well so quickly, Shikamaru offered in compliment as he stepped back into the house. Naruto perked up at hearing the praise from his adopted brother. But you are still 50 years away from beating me at this game. Naruto's smile faded as he picked up a random piece and flung it with unerring accuracy at the back of Shikamaru's head. As the Nara turned to face his attacker, Naruto stuck his tongue out at the boy and bolted towards the wooded area that surrounded much of the clan compound. He had had his revenge, now it was time to train. Naruto arrived at a clearing he used for training whilst in the clan compound and began molding chakra in his right hand. A faint whisper of blue chakra accumulated in his hands for several seconds before it dissipated into the winds. Growling to himself, Naruto sat down on the forest floor and tried to remember what he had read about the technique in the scroll of seals. The first part of the technique was to gather chakra in the palm of the one's hand and use it to levitate a leaf over a period of time at a fixed distance away from the palm. Naruto's control had vastly improved since their training exercises in the land of waves, however, he was unable to sustain the technique for a sufficient amount of time. Naruto was able to vaguely recall using the technique on Mizuki and Haku, but could not draw upon the specifics to help him recreate the effect. Sighing, Naruto practiced his tree walking for a while longer in hopes that it would help with his training for the chakra beam technique. After completing several runs from top to bottom, Naruto stopped training his control and reverted back to improving the chakra beam. Naruto placed a leaf on his palm and began gathering chakra watching as the leaf rose a few inches and hovered at the predetermined distance for a while. It was progress, but Naruto could not judge if it was sufficient progress. Deciding that he would need to use the technique from both his palms, Naruto began training in the first part of the technique with his left hand. Naruto had realized very early that if he was to become a swordsman, a technique such as the chakra beam would be ill-suited to him if he was only able to use the technique with his sword hand. This would mean that Naruto would have to drop his sword in order to use the technique, and so the blonde decided to learn it with both hands so that it afforded him versatility. As the light began to fade, Naruto decided to head home and freshen up before dinner. He would start training with Yugao in earnest tomorrow, and there was no point if he wore himself out the night before. After a quick breakfast, Naruto had gone to training ground 4 to meet Yugao. As he had arrived a little earlier than the planned 8 o'clock start time, he decided to limber up by doing some light exercises. Yugao arrived in a shunshin just as Naruto was about to finish up his exercises and waited until he did. She knew his routine, it would only take a few moments. Deciding to make her presence known, Yugao shunshined from her spot in the tree into the clearing that was their designated meeting place. All right Naruto, the Hokage has approved you learning the Kage Bunshin Jutsu, but I need to make you aware of the risks of the technique before I can teach you how to do. The technique creates clones that are actual copies of your body, which means they have a physical presence. Furthermore, the technique divides the amount of chakra the user uses evenly into the clones that were created. 
I am sure I don't need to tell you what might happen if you were to create more clones than you can handle, Yu Gao said solemnly, letting the word sink in before she continued with the appropriate hand signs for the technique. The Kage Bunshin, like Kakashi-san told you, can be used to multiply your training time. Since you gain all the experience of the dispelled clones, this technique is very useful in learning a lot of things in a lot less time. Having said that, the mental backlash of dispelling several clones simultaneously and assimilating all that information will be severe, so once again, make sure you know how much stress you can handle, Yuga continued, watching Naruto as he nodded at all the right times to show that he understood the risks of the technique. Yuga wasn't completely convinced with his response, but decided to move on regardless. Naruto waited patiently, he had remembered all the details about the Tajukage Bunshin technique from the Scroll of Seals, and realized that since the whole process required permission from the Hokage, such matters needed to be addressed. Nonetheless, the blonde was getting jumpy and began to slightly rock back and forth on his heels in anticipation. Watching the swing boy, Yugao decided it was enough of the talk and time to get into the action. Showing Naruto the simple hand seal required for the technique, she created a clone herself to demonstrate how useful it could be. Unlike the Bunshin Jutsu, this body is real, which means it can do physical damage, and since it has its own chakra, it can cast Jutsu as well, Yugao finished as the clone unleashed a low-level Katen Jutsu away from the group. After a few hours, Naruto had managed to successfully complete the technique. Under Yugao's watchful eye and bountiful advice, Naruto had managed to split his chakra effectively enough to make a suitable shadow clone. Let me show you something, Yugao said as she made another clone, her previous one having dispelled ages ago. As Yuga's shadow clone led Naruto's own away from their originals, Yuga continued. Remember what I told you about learning from your clones? She asked. Unaware of what was really happening, Naruto just nodded dumbly, trying to figure out what the point of taking the clone away was. With a sudden influx of information, Naruto proceeded to obey a silent command and ducked his head to the ground. Just as he made the motion, Yuga swung her right arm in a chopping motion parallel to the ground in an attempt to swipe at Naruto's head. Very good. The purple-haired Kanoichi said, genuinely impressed at the speed with which Naruto was able to process the information and act upon it. Sure she could have struck him without giving him the amount of time she did, but it was his first attempt at the memory assimilation from a dispelled Kage Bunshin, it was only fair. Naruto rose from his crouched position in the ground and faced his teacher, his jaw hanging loosely from the disbelief that his teacher would to attempt to attack him. What are you doing? You were going straight for my temple. You could have knocked me out said the blonde, aghast at the execution of this teaching method. Yugao merely offered a shrug. Train in the technique. Focus on channeling the right amount of chakra you need to make a set number of clones. Make a pair, then five, then seven and ten. When you can do that we will continue with your kenjutsu training, Yugao said, deciding to stand in the shade of the trees as the sun shone brighter. Naruto strained to focus on channeling the right amount of chakra for the technique. This was much harder than creating a single clone. Focusing on creating the clones was especially different when the sensation of splitting your chakra was so alien. Nonetheless, once he was accustomed to the feeling, it wasn't quite as uncomfortable, and Naruto was able to meet Yugao's target in just over an hour. Before he could dispel the ten clones he had so painstakingly created, Yugao appeared out of air in front of him. Don't get rid of them just yet. Why don't you make them do the chakra training exercises you learnt in Wave? We can grab some lunch before we start, Yugao said. So everything the clones learn, I learn when they are dispelled right? Naruto asked, clogs turning in his head as he wondered about the true potential of this feature of the technique. Yugao just nodded in response and began to walk away from the clearing and towards the shade, where a shadow clone she had created had brought and kept some packed lunches for the pair of them. Naruto thought to himself as he turned to face his clones. Okay, split up into two groups. One of you do the tree climbing exercise that Yugao sensei asked us to do, and the rest of you work on doing the chakra beam. Work on adding some power into the technique for the right hand and some control for the left. Thanks guys. Naruto shouted the last bit over his back as he jogged up to join Yugao for lunch. Lunch was a simple affair consisting of the bento box that Yugao's clone had prepared for the two of them. It was only when Naruto finally sat down on the grass did he realize how tired he was. Collapsing to the ground in an undignified heap, Naruto ate his share of the food in the box, after an eager exclamation of Ida Akamasu. Yuga let Naruto rest up for a while longer after all the food was consumed. It wasn't needed in any case, since Naruto showed remarkable rates of recovery amongst shinobi. Yuga would be hard-pressed to match Naruto's progress with the Kage Bunshin Jutsu, but in her defense, she did not possess a massive chakra battery in the form of the Kayubi nestled in under her navel. All right then, let's go check up on your clones and see what they've managed to get up to, Yuga said as she got up, dusting the seat of her trousers to rid of all the grass that might have clung on during their lunch break. 
As they re-entered the clearing, Yu Gao was surprised to see a group of Naruto clones near sprinting the height of the trees, dodging branches with ease as they reached their respective trees' zenith. You can dispel your clones now Naruto. I see you have pretty much mastered the tree climbing exercise. Remind me to teach you the next phase of the chakra control exercises when we have some time. As Naruto dispelled the ten clones, he received a huge amount of information, as well as replenished some of his chakra. Alright. Come on then. Know that you know the Kage Bunshin technique, I can teach you the forms required for the dance of the crescent moon, Yuga said. The rest of the day involved Naruto using his shadow clones to learn the advanced kenjutsu form. Yuga decided to teach Naruto the form by making him experience it firsthand. By the end of the day, Yuga had gone through a veritable army of susceptible Naruto clones, slashing the clones in spectacular fashion. Yuga told Naruto that the point of this method was to learn the approach of the technique and the principles behind this form. It was quite a difficult thing to master at such a young age, but Yugao had felt Naruto had the aptitude to understand the basics and build up the technique as suited him best. Naruto left the training ground feeling absolutely mortified he had been slashed up so many times by Yugao that he felt a little queasy. Every time Naruto would be executed Yugao would come up to him and ask him questions about the form what he learned, what was different from the previous attack, and what he would do to change things. It was a refreshing change of pace, but that did not mean he was completely at ease with watching a copy of himself get chopped up mercilessly. Naruto was beginning to question Yugao's sensitivity and sanity, this was the same woman who went out of her way to protect him and instruct him. However, when Yugao had a sword in her hand, Naruto could have sworn she was no longer the caring teacher he once had she was the stone-cold killer that was once a part of Anbu. The next day, Naruto entered the clearing at training ground 4 to see two Yugaos waiting for him. Confused, Naruto made his way to the pair of them while they continued talking. Alright Naruto. Since you've mastered the tree climbing exercise, my clone will teach your clones the next phase of the chakra control program. Make about 10 clones and ask them to follow my own, said the Yugao on the right of Naruto, indicating herself to be the creator and not the copy. Doing as instructed, Naruto created the 10 clones, and the near dozen copies wordlessly followed the Yugao clone away from the clearing. So, what exactly is the next phase of the chakra control program? Naruto asked, curious as to what his clones were going to be subject to. Water walking. Unlike with the tree climbing exercise, you need to constantly shift your chakra to match your body's, need to sustain itself on the surface of the water, fail to do so, and you'll sink below, replied Yugao. Nodding in understanding, Naruto waited as he watched Yugao pull a pair of ankle weights out of the rucksack she had tossed on the clearing floor before Naruto had arrived. Naruto's dreaded speed training session had begun, it was critical that he increased his speed so that he could execute the dance of the crescent moon with perfection. Yugao had explained that the technique utilized the Kage Bunshin to attack the opponent from multiple angles, and if the speed of the user was not up to par, a skillful opponent could counter the attack. While Naruto had yet to learn the technique in earnest, for he had only seen Yugao use it, she explained that if the basics of the technique were not mastered, then the technique would be rendered useless, there was a reason it was marked an air and kinjutsu technique after all. Over the next few days, Naruto trained almost exclusively with his speed under the hawk-like gaze of Yugao. She pointed out aspects of his running style that could be improved and how he should alter his style when approaching an enemy with his sword in hand. Naruto only trained in the basic kinjutsu since the break Team 7 and Team Yugao had been afforded since the mission to the Land of Waves. Yugao had certainly noticed the improvement in Naruto's use of the sword and was quite pleased with herself for nurturing such a talent. At the end of every day, Yugao would ask Naruto to dispel the clones he had created earlier in the day and try the water walking exercise for himself. Having accumulated the memories of his clones, Naruto wisely chose to strip down to his bare essentials, lest he had to return home, drenched in water. Alright Naruto. Let's see what your clones have learned from mine, Yugao instructed Naruto. Naruto had learned the technique within two days with the help of his clone, and Yugao was pleased with his performance. As Naruto balanced himself on the water shakily he looked up to his sensei with a proud smile on his face. Yugao sensei I got it. I can water walk now, said Naruto, trying to take a few shaky experimental steps to prove his point. Just as he turned to face Yugao once again, he saw her throw a kunai at his direction. The projectile was slow moving but headed directly for Naruto's left shoulder. Panicking, Naruto turned hastily in an attempt to dodge the thrown dagger, but instantaneously lost his footing on the surface of the water, falling in the waist-deep water of the stream they had been practicing in. Dragging himself onto the bank of the river, Naruto coughed out the water he had unintentionally swallowed. As he regained his composure, Naruto pointed an accusatory finger at his teacher. What are you doing? Naruto shouted, waving his finger around as if to emphasize his displeasure. You could have seriously hurt me there. 
Water walking isn't a technique you can use to knock out an opponent, it's an accessory for a ninja. If you cannot maintain your balance after a single attack, you can't win a battle on water. To truly master water walking, you need to be able to move on water as subconsciously as you would on land. Remember that because the next part of your water walking training will be done by yourself, with your own clones, aiming to knock you down with your own kunai. Said Yugao, driving home the point to the blonde that his training was never well and truly finished. Naruto attempted to sputter a response, but quickly conceded the point. If he was up against Abusa and a battle on water, he was sure that the demon of the mist would spare him no quarter. That's it for today. You have the day off tomorrow so rest up. We will see if we can get a mission soon, Yugao told the blonde, causing him to light up at the prospect of another mission. So I will stop here guys. That's it for today. Hope you all enjoyed this video if you do please leave a like share and subscribe, also don't forget to check it out author of this fanfic link in channel about her description, also thanks for watching guys, love you all.